The Finance Committee will come to order. <clears throat> and on behalf of Senator Crapo and myself, it is our hope that this morning's hearing on the state of mental health for our youth serves as a wake-up call. Millions of young Americans are struggling under a mental health epidemic, struggling in school, struggling with addiction or isolation, struggling to make it from one day to the next. Our country is in danger of losing much of a generation if mental health care remains business as usual. For families across the land, this is the issue, the issue that dominates their living rooms and their kitchens with the Children's Health Insurance Program and Medicaid. The largest payers of mental health care for vulnerable young people. They're within our jurisdiction, and that means the Finance Committee has got to come up with solutions. I hear way too many heartbreaking stories from parents and young people at Oregon town hall meetings at the grocery store, at the grocery store and the schools that I visited across the state. I'm certain that's the way for every member of this committee. Imagine being a parent, scrambling desperately to find help for your kid who's in crisis, who may be a danger to themselves or somebody else. Too many parents are making call after call after call, only to find there aren't any beds available, or that the wait list to see a psychiatrist could be weeks or months long, or they're told that their insurance company won't pay for the care that a psychiatrist says their child needs. <clears throat> now, the law requires equality between coverage for physical health and coverage for mental health. Yet too many families in America are put through bureaucratic torment when they try to get that coverage, coverage that they pay vast sums for. Your kid is suffering, the insurance company takes thousands of dollars in premiums from your pocket, and yet often you get little more than jazz in your ear while you sit on hold. So there's new urgency for the Congress. Diagnosing an issue and getting the right care for young people was plenty hard before anybody had ever heard of COVID-19. The crisis is significantly larger today. Kids are feeling isolated, depression is up. Suicide attempts are up. An estimated 140,000 kids have lost a parent or a caretaker to COVID-19. That number will continue to rise. The bottom line, every loving parent wants what's best for their child. So as a nation, can't we come together and show the same level of concern for our young people. And that's why having Dr. Murthy here is so valuable, because he put out at the end of the year a clarion call to the country to come together, recognize how serious this is, and take it on. So we're very fortunate to have him. He's been a crusader for improving mental health care for our kids. He spent some time in Eugene, Oregon, where, of course, our now a famous CAHOOTS program that brought together mental health providers and law enforcement people to tackle mental health got started. And Dr. Murthy is going to help us attack the challenge from all sides, including how to help families navigate a broken, complicated mental health care system, how to respond to a young person in crisis without demonizing them or criminalizing them how to build on what's proven to work when it comes to health care for kids, specifically CHIP and Medicaid, and when it comes to showing what works, our colleague Senator Stabenow and her terrific work on behavioral health has been a real, in our part of the world, we call it a trailblazer for showing how to make sure that kids get help. 
So here's the road ahead for the committee. And I want to thank Senator Crapo. We have spent months and months saying that this is going to be a bipartisan effort. We know that the political scene is polarized. We believe this is so important. We've got to work on a bipartisan uh, basis. And with today's hearing, the Finance Committee ramps up our legislative efforts. Several of our members are going to be partnering on specific policy challenges. We will have one Democrat and one Republican. The goal is to produce a bipartisan bill that brings all together. Senators Carper and Cassidy will be focusing on the subject of today's hearing, mental health care for America's children. I have pulled, heard both of them, Senator Carper and Senator Cassidy, talk passionately about how taking care of kids here is the ball game because we all understand it. You got a choice. You can get there early, or if you don't, you play catch up ball for years and years to come. Then we'll have uh, Senator Stabenow and Senator Daines working on the mental health care workforce. So, part of this, and you see it with Senator Stabenow's great work on behavioral health, you can have a great program. We need more workforce. And all over the country, we're hearing about challenges there. Senator Cortez Mastow and Senator Cornyn will look at how to make mental health care more seamless because too many people fall between the cracks. Senator Bennett and Senator Burr will uh, focus on how mental health care gets finally treated the same way as physical health care, a special passion of mine, particularly because we launched our investigations after a debacle at the Oregon Health Sciences Center where they couldn't get their claims paid early on in the pandemic because the insurance companies were stalling. Senators Cardin and Thune will team up on making it easier to get mental health care via telehealth. And finally, I want to just mention what the direction here is, you know, really the lodestar for what the co committee really has talked about in the past. Everybody in America must be able to get the mental health care they need when they need it. That is really the North Star here. So we're going to stay busy with hearings featuring mental health experts and advocates. Uh, this morning's hearing will be the first of two that put a special focus on our young people. And before wrapping up, I'd like to say, because he's not here uh, today, I want to thank the uh, senator from South Carolina, Senator Scott, who has talked with me at considerable length about the CAHOOTS bill that I mentioned that we were able to secure a billion dollars in Medicaid for. He is just instrumental in this alliance between mental health people and law enforcement because both groups want to focus on what they have been trained for. Mental health folks want to focus on mental health. Law enforcement say, we don't want to focus on mental health. We want to focus on what we're trained for. Senator Scott's been very helpful. So, Dr. Murthy, thank you for joining us. We're going to turn it over to Senator Crapo for his opening remarks, and then we're looking forward to hearing from you. Senator Crapo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Murthy, for being here today. This discussion comes at a crucial time. Our nation is confronting an unprecedented range of challenges, many of which are, have serious implications for the mental health of all Americans, especially children. From school closures to lock and lockdowns to other COVID-related restrictions, the pandemic has intensified feelings of social isolation, helplessness, and anxiety. Since the pandemic began, we've witnessed alarming spikes in suicide attempts and suicidal ideation among teenagers, along with a staggering rise in drug overdose deaths. Dr. Murthy, as you noted in your advisory, Rates of psychological distress among young people appear to have increased across the board in the past few years. Unfortunately, even prior to COVID-19, many of these trends pointed in the wrong direction. That said, I share your sense of optimism in tackling the urgent issues at hand. In communities across the country, we have seen families, faith leaders, policymakers, and healthcare providers come together to craft creative and sustainable mental health prevention, access, and treatment solutions. Thanks to the Chairman's leadership, we have the opportunity to bolster these efforts through a bipartisan process to advance targeted, consensus-driven, and fiscally responsible policies that drive better outcomes for all Americans. 
By focusing on shared priorities and adhering to core guiding principles, this process can culminate in comprehensive legislation that our colleagues across the political spectrum will enthusiastically support. Building consensus will maximize our ability to see the work we conduct here signed into law. We must also uphold fiscal integrity, fully paying for any and all provisions we look to enact. As working families across the nation contend with the highest inflation in 40 years, strained finances pose a grave threat to health care access. Unrestrained government spending risks pushing inflation even higher, further accelerating the decline of Americans' purchasing power. Moreover, with each passing year, we're steadily moving closer to the Medicare Trust Fund's exhaustion date, at which time the program will no longer be able to pay full benefits for our nation's seniors. We must be thoughtful and cautious to avoid exacerbating the fiscal challenges we face. Likewise, we must ensure that any pay-fors that we advance do not in any way compromise economic growth, undermine biomedical innovation, or undercut our recovery. Across the board, bipartisan support will prove essential. By aligning our process with these basic principles and guardrails, we can produce a meaningful bill carefully tailored to meet the challenges that confront us. This committee has a strong track record of generating consensus-based bills from the Chronic Care Act to the Retirement Enhancement and Security Act, which ultimately passed as the SECURE Act in 2019. I believe truly that we can replicate that success here. As the committee begins its work, we do so having built a strong foundation of shared interests and objectives. For instance, the pandemic has highlighted the pressing need for expanded access to telehealth, especially for Medicare beneficiaries. Our committee took an essential first step toward addressing these barriers by codifying permanent Medicare coverage for mental health services, regardless of geographic location, including services provided in the home. However, gaps remain and we will work to bridge them here. Strengthening the mental and behavioral health workforce will also prove vital, especially in the face of widespread provider stress, fatigue and burnout which the pandemic has escalated. I hear every day from doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals across Idaho who are looking to reduce hours or leave their practices entirely in the months to come, confronted with an unprecedented range of demands. Too often, sadly, policymakers have inadvertently added to these challenges, imposing bureaucratic requirements and tasks that divert attention from patient care and hinder providers' workplace wellness. As we navigate potential policy options, we should look to avenues for enhancing flexibilities, both for providers and for states, as they seek to improve and innovate across the continuum of care. These and other focal points from encouraging service integration to promoting modernization present opportunities for bipartisan discussions that will enable our healthcare system to serve all Americans more effectively. In that spirit, I look forward to your testimony, Dr. Murthy, and to a timely discussion of mental and behavioral health solutions. And thank you again for being here. Thank you, Senator Crapo. And I was glad you mentioned the telehealth issue because it sort of highlights how this committee keeps building on bipartisan work. Uh, General Murthy, when Chairman Hatch was head of the committee, Senator Crapo and I and Senator Stabenow, all work together because Medicare is no longer, you know, primarily an acute care program. It's primarily a, a, a chronic disease program, cancer and diabetes and hearts and stroke. And the big provision was the telehealth expansion. And we were really pleased when uh, Seema Verma, looking at the landscape, said, hey, we got something. It's already been fleshed out. And what the Finance Committee did in the Chronic Care Bill on telehealth largely became those first telehealth provisions. So we're going to keep working with you to just kind of keep building. Now, before you testify, we have to give you um, a uh, official introduction. And so Dr. Murthy is the nation's doctor. He is the vice admiral of the U.S. Public um, Health Service Commission Corps. This is his second tour in the role, serving as Surgeon General from 2014 to 2017. During that time, he undertook initiatives to address Ebola and Zika, 
the opioid crisis, and the growing threat of stress and loneliness to Americans' physical and mental health. Prior to serving as Surgeon General, he co-founded multiple organizations aimed at improving people's health and well-being, both here and abroad. He also practices as a physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, where he completed his medical training in internal medicine. He received his medical degree from Yale, his master's in public administration from the Yale School of Management, and his bachelor's of arts from Harvard. Dr. Murthy, we now turn to you. The formalities are over. Um, we'd like to hear from you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Chairman Wyden. Uh, and to you, to Ranking Member Crapo, to members of the committee, just thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, today and to speak with you. Uh, I have the privilege of speaking to you today as a Surgeon General of the United States and as a Vice Admiral in the Public Health Service Commission Corps, uh, one of our eight uniformed services in the U.S. government. And I'm most importantly here as the father of two young children. Uh, my son is five, my daughter is four, and they are the reason that I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to speak with all of you today. Over the next few years, my children and millions of their peers will start down the path to adulthood. <clears throat> Each of their paths will be different. All will be filled with challenges along the way. But it's these challenges that I want to talk to you about today because I'm deeply concerned as a parent and as a doctor that the obstacles this generation of young people face are unprecedented and uniquely hard to navigate. And the impact that's having on their mental health is devastating. There are a number of long-standing preventable factors that are driving this crisis. The recent ubiquity of technology platforms, especially social media platforms, have had harmful effects on many children, though undoubtedly they serve as a benefit uh, to the lives of many in important ways. These platforms have also exacerbated feelings of loneliness, futility, and low self-esteem for some youth. They've also contributed to a bombardment of messages, both via traditional and social media, that undermine this generation's sense of self-worth. Messages that tell our kids with greater frequency and volume than ever before that they are not good-looking enough, not popular enough, not smart enough, not rich enough, simply not enough. Similarly, while bullying has always been a problem, cyberbullying has expanded the playing field. Anyone anywhere, anytime, can be tormented or be a tormentor. And meanwhile, progress on the issues that will determine the world this generation will inherit, like economic inequality, climate change, racial injustice, LGBTQ rights, the opioid epidemic, and gun violence feels too slow. It's undercutting the fundamental American promise for many of our children, their hope in the possibility of a better future. All of these factors affecting youth mental health were true before the COVID-19 pandemic, but the last two years have dramatically changed young people's experiences at home, at school, and in their communities. It's not just the unfathomable number of deaths or the instability, it's also the pervasive sense of uncertainty and the nagging sense of fear. It's the isolation from loved ones, from friends, and from communities at a moment where human support systems are irreplaceable and more needed than ever before. But at the heart of our youth mental health crisis is a pervasive stigma that tells young people they should be embarrassed if they are struggling with depression, anxiety, stress, or loneliness. It makes a human condition feel inhuman. I felt that stigma myself 35 years ago, growing up in Miami as a kid who didn't look the same as other children whose immigrant parents didn't eat the same food or dress the same way as other parents did. And when that led me to feel persistently lonely, isolated, and anxious, when it led me to get bullied and called racial slurs by classmates who constantly told me that I didn't belong, I felt a deep sense of shame, like it was somehow my fault, like I had nowhere to go. And no one, even my unconditionally loving and supportive family, who I could turn to for help. A world of shame and stigma where children can't get the help that they need. This is not the world that I want for my kids, for your children and grandchildren, and for kids across our country. 
But senators, we are on the verge of beating back one public health crisis in COVID-19, only to see another grow in its place. In 2019, the year before the pandemic, one in three high school students reported feeling persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, up 40%, 40% from a decade prior. From 2011 to 2015, youth psychiatric visits to emergency departments for depression, anxiety, and behavioral challenges increased by 28%. Between 2007 and 2018, suicide rates among youth age 10 to 24 increased by 57%, a total of 65,000 26 young people lost. As devastating as these numbers are, the real tragedy is that we are failing as a country to adequately respond to them. Even before the pandemic, we were not doing enough to provide adequate care and treatment options in every community. And COVID-19 has only made that disparity worse. We are not doing enough as a country to build and maintain a sufficient and diverse mental health workforce. And we are not doing enough to integrate our mental health care system with the rest of the health care system, particularly primary care. We are not, as a country, doing enough to prevent, not just treat, this crisis. Many mental health challenges first emerge early in life. And studies suggest that the average delay between the onset of mental health symptoms and treatment is 11 years. 11 long, confusing, isolating, and painful years. Now we have an opportunity, and I believe the responsibility to make change happen now. Late last year, I released my Surgeon General's Advisory on Youth Mental Health, which outlines the policy, institutional, and individual changes it will take to reframe and address these challenges. Out of the many recommendations in the advisory, I'd like to highlight four today. First, ensuring that every child has access to high quality, affordable, culturally competent mental health care. To do this, we must make sure that children are enrolled in healthcare coverage. We also need to expand our mental health workforce from clinical psychologists, school counselors, and psychiatrists to recovery coaches and peer specialists. And we need to make sure care is delivered at the right place and right time, whether that's in healthcare settings like primary care practices or community-based settings like schools, or whether it's in person or through telehealth. Second, focusing on prevention by investing in school and community-based programs that have been shown to improve the mental health and emotional well-being of children at low cost and high benefit. We've seen the extraordinary potential of certain strategies and programs, from Project AWARE to Beyond Differences to the Family Checkup, and these are just a few examples. We need to invest in scaling these programs across the country, and that must go hand in hand with continuing to address the systemic, economic, and social barriers that contribute to and create the conditions for poor mental health for young people, their families, and their caregivers. Third, we need to better understand the impact that technology and social media have on mental health. At a minimum, if technology companies are going to continue to conduct a massive national experiment on our children, then public health experts and the public at large must be the ones to analyze the data to draw conclusions and to draft recommendations, not the companies alone. That's how we give parents and caregivers the ability to make informed choices about their kids' use of technology. The final recommendation concerns individuals and community engagement. The role that we each have to play in overcoming the stigma associated with mental illness and with seeking help. No child should feel ashamed of their hurt, their confusion, their isolation, and no one should feel too ashamed to ask for help. If we don't keep working toward a culture that normalizes and promotes mental health care, then the consequences of our inattention and neglect will continue to ripple across generation, across class, and across geography. It's something we each as parents and siblings, as teachers, as friends and leaders, have the power to start changing today by choosing to reach out to children in our lives, by letting them know that they are not alone in their struggles, and by sharing our own stories. Our obligation to act is not just medical, it's moral. It's not only about saving lives, it's about listening to our kids who are concerned about the state of the world that they are set to inherit. It's about our opportunity to rebuild the world that we want to give them, a world that fundamentally refocuses our priorities on people and community, 
and builds a culture of kindness, inclusion, and respect. My job as Surgeon General is to help lay the foundation for a healthier nation. But that foundation isn't built solely by putting warning labels on cigarette packs. It's built by focusing our attention on our nation's most pressing public health concerns and by fostering connection, community, and resilience. A house where people are isolated, where they feel left behind economically, socially, and professionally, where they feel unsafe and where they feel like they do not matter, this is a house that cannot stand. But I believe that if we seize this moment and step up for our children and families in this moment of need, we can lay that foundation right now. I appreciate you having me here today. I appreciate you coming together to help take on this issue for our nation, for my kids, and for millions of kids across this country. And I appreciate you giving this issue the attention it sorely deserves. Thank you, Senators. Doctor, thank you. And uh, this is exactly what we hoped for, a powerful kickoff, a call to action. And I want to start in another area where we have a bond. It's very clear to, you, to me that this is personal to both of us. You describe as a young person how you felt the stigma, the, the hot scorn and, and cruelty. Uh, my brother struggled with schizophrenia for years. Not a night went by in the Wyden household when we went to bed not worried that he was going to hurt himself or hurt somebody else. And I felt right at the heart of what he was dealing with was the stigma. And he looked at me and he said, my brother plays basketball, look at me. He said, I'm sick. And it just really got me every single night. And these numbers, they just take your breath away. In early 2021, emergency department visits for suspected suicide attempts were 51% higher for adolescent girls. That's what I meant when I was concerned about the possibility of losing much of a generation. So tell us your assessment of where we are with respect to tackling you know, stigma, because it sure looks to me like the problem hasn't gotten better. And what you think, because you got the bipartisan leadership of the committee here, you got our attention on what to do about it. Your thoughts? Well, thank you, Senator. I realize that one cannot legislate stigma away, yet it stands as one of the great challenges to us being able to address our mental health crisis. Stigma fundamentally, Senator, as you know, is about shame. It's about feeling ashamed of something we are going through. It's about feeling ashamed of who we are. And the challenge for people who are struggling with their mental health is they often come to believe that it's their fault, that it's reflective of a fundamental flaw they have. That sense of shame drives them further and further uh, into a dark corner at this exact time where they need more human connection and support. There are things I think we can do as a country uh, to address the stigma. I think number one, uh, we can reach out to the children in our lives. We can open an, up a conversation about mental health and help them understand it is okay to struggle from time to time. That is human. It's what we all go through uh, and that it's okay to ask for help. The second thing we can do is we can share our stories with the people in our lives and with the public more broadly. Uh, one, of the thing I've been, one of the things I have been grateful to see uh, is more athletes, more elected leaders, uh, more community leaders stand up and share their own struggles with mental health. Uh, every time that happens, it tells another young person uh, that they aren't alone. And that is one of the great uh, difficulties of struggling with the mental health is feeling that you are alone. But cultural change ultimately, it takes all of us stepping up and recognizing the role we play in shaping how people uh, talk about mental health and shaping the conversation around mental health. Uh, we need to be talking about it more, not less. We need to be addressing it not just in our families, but talking about it in the halls of Congress as all of you uh, ha have done, uh, which I so appreciate. Um, but that's how stigma changes. It's when people stand up, speak up, and choose to think differently about an issue like mental we'll, health. We'll be certainly talking to you often about that in our work. I want to turn now to the question of parity. 
and for all of our families who had watched loved ones suffer. That day when Paul Wellstone, a liberal Democrat, and Pete Domenici, a conservative Republican, got the parity law passed, we felt like a big boulder had been lifted off our shoulders. We were going to get a fair shake for mental health in America. And so I have been doing oversight on these insurance companies for years. And I will tell you, I think the commitment to parity that's embedded in federal law is honored more in the breach than in the observance. And particularly during the pandemic, the insurance companies just seemed to find one excuse after another to not follow through and cover people. And families couldn't find providers who take insurance. There were all kinds of games about, could you get somebody in network or out of the network? Mountains and mountains of red tape. Because my time is out, we're going to talk to you, obviously, more about it. I'd be interested in your take with respect to this parity issue. Because I think I mentioned to you, my Oregon Health Sciences University, they couldn't get claims paid for months. I opened an investigation. All the claims got paid at once. That's not a system that the only way they'll pay claims is if their senator puts something in the newspaper. So give us your assessment of where we are on the parity issue, and particularly what you see with respect to compliance. And I know this is not a scientific um, judgment you can give, but where you think we are. Well, Senator, I remember where I was when I learned about the 2008 parity law. I was practicing medicine at Brigham Women's Hospital. I had seen the toll of mental health uh, on my patients, and I knew how hard it was for people to get mental health care. And I was hopeful when, I, when that law passed that it would change that reality. I think the honest truth is that we still have a gap, that for many people, uh, parity does not exist in terms of the coverage they get for mental health services versus uh, traditional health care services. That is a travesty, and we have to close that gap. Uh, the, the Biden administration and, uh, and the Department of Health and Human Services in particular have issued a report recently on these gaps uh, that we currently face, where health insurance companies need to step up and reimburse adequately for mental health services. Uh, the administration is certainly expanding in a multi-agency way, it's uh, the number of individuals to do the investigations. It's also moving to require uh, insurers to provide proof that they are in fact meeting the parity requirements and working to provide additional technical assistance to states so that they can also work to hold insurers accountable. This is going to be essential for access. I'm over my time and we're gonna work with you on that as well. Senator Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Murthy, in your advisory, uh, you note the rapid shift toward telehealth at the start of the pandemic, as well as the potential for telemedicine to serve a lasting role in improving healthcare quality for our young people. Given your medical background and your ongoing engagement with healthcare providers, what do you see as some of the best practices for clinicians as they work to integrate telehealth into their practices for long term? And what factors should they consider as they tailor these models and services to younger patients? Well, so Senator, thank you for that question. I am a big believer in the power of technology to improve the quality and delivery of healthcare if uh, it is used appropriately. Uh, I think currently telehealth has tremendous promise, expand access uh, to mental health care. We still have challenges to address, including expanding broadband access. Uh, we still need to ensure that not only in the public uh, in payer system, but in the private payer system, that there's adequate reimbursement uh, for virtual care. Uh, and we also have to ensure that privacy uh, is uh, protected at all times on these platforms. I think as individual clinicians look to utilize uh, you know, you know, virtual platforms in telemedicine, it's important not only for them to, uh, to recognize and to honor those privacy concerns, but also to recognize that there are times where we do need to see people in person. The advent of telemedicine is not entirely a substitute for in-person care, but it is a good supplement, uh, especially for people who have traditionally had difficulty accessing care. Um, but finally, it, it requires a conversation with patients themselves. Not everyone will be comfortable utilizing 
uh, you know, telemedicine. Some will be more comfortable than others. Young people tend to be much more comfortable with technology. And this is a, a kind, the kind of tool that I believe, if appropriately introduced and utilized, can increase access for young people to mental health care. Well, thank you. And <clears throat> moving to a, the issue of providers, uh, our nation's health care workforce has provided unparalleled uh, resilience and expertise and dynamism as they've dealt with the COVID-19 crisis. Unfortunately, while the pandemic response efforts of these past two years have highlighted these strengths, the COVID-19 problem has also exacerbated the stress, fatigue, and strain uh, facing far too many from, of our frontline providers. A recent study found that one in every five physicians would likely leave their current practice within two years and that nearly one third of healthcare professionals planned to reduce their hours in the next 12 months. Dr. Murthy, in the past you've discussed the pressing challenges posed by physician burnout, which has serious implications, not just for healthcare workers, but for patients, particularly in communities plagued by shortages of, uh, shortages of providers. Expanded access to telehealth and other virtual health technologies could help to bridge these gaps. But other interventions, however well-intentioned, seem likely to increase bureaucratic strain and divert time and attention from patient care. My question to you is, what role do you see technology, from telehealth to AI and other cutting-edge innovations, as playing in reducing provider burnout moving forward? And how can we promote these tools without creating needless new burdens and stressors for our healthcare professionals? Senator, I appreciate you highlighting the issue of clinician burnout. I'm deeply concerned about it. I think it's gotten worse, not better. Uh, and I do think technology can play a positive role, but it can also be harmful if not utilized properly. I think if technology is used uh, to provide greater access to telemedicine, uh, which gives flexibilities to both patients and clinicians, that can be a net benefit. If technology is designed around the needs of patients uh, and healthcare providers, that can also be beneficial. If you could give you a counterexample, you look at electronic health records right now, and many of them are designed for billing purposes, uh, much more so than for patient care. Uh, and that creates strain and burden uh, for clinicians at a time when that technology should be used uh, to enable uh, easier care for their patients. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this. And uh, as the chairman said, uh, we look forward to continuing to pursue these issues with you and the many that we haven't had time to talk about uh, in our questioning. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Senator, Senator Craibon. We're seeing it all the time in Oregon and Idaho, and we're going to be working together. Senator Stabenow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. I so appreciate the focus that you're giving on the leadership you're giving on this. And I have to say, uh, Dr. Murthy, I so appreciate your report and focus on young people. Uh, we know that one out of five Americans will have a mental illness in their lifetime, and that number actually uh, may be going up as related to the pandemic. As the chairman talked about, and I think there are many, many of us in this chamber who have experiences ourselves or our families. You know, for me, it was my dad being bipolar before there was a diagnosis, before there was treatment, before there was medication. I saw what happened when he didn't have those things and then when he did, and the transformation in him and and our family. And so I, I wish that for everyone, which means we have to treat uh, healthcare above the neck, the same as healthcare below the neck. So that's part of getting rid of the stigma. Um, but we know that children and young adults have been particularly hard hit, and certainly your report shows that anxiety, depression, other issues have become way too common, and far too many children and young people have gone without treatment. And social media only makes it worse. Um, every single day. So our, our children need help, and I'd like to talk about two different venues to do that. Um, one is school-based health centers, which I think are absolutely essential in addressing what's been happening, particularly now with the pandemic on school-age youth. And school-based health centers provide critical, can provide critical behavioral health services, both uh, addiction services and mental health services, as well as physical. And we're, we're inching along. I mean, back during the Affordable Care Act, I was able to get 
$200 million over five years into the ACA for infrastructure to create health clinics, but we've never actually put money into the operations every year. Um, and so this year, there's $60 million included in the Senate appropriations money in the House as well for the first time for operations. And we need to do more uh, to really strengthen that. Uh, Senator Capito and I, are working. Uh, we have legislation, health care uh, for hallways to move forward to really aggressively address what we need uh, for our children's schools. So could you speak to the importance and benefits of reaching children in school-based settings like the school-based health clinics and how can we use them to expand what we need to do in behavioral health? Well, Senator, th thank you for that question, and uh, thank you also for your uh, leadership on this issue, for all of your work to support and get certified community behavioral health centers uh, in communities uh, across the country. Um, look, one general principle in healthcare that I believe applies here as well is that you're better off if you bring care to people where they are. Our kids are in school. The better we're able to bring care to schools through counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, the more easily we're gonna be able to identify uh, mental health struggles early and get kids the care that they need. That's why I think school-based uh, clinics are so important. It's why uh, the investments uh, that were made through the American Rescue Plan uh, to give billions of dollars to schools in part to help them hire more mental health providers and counselors in schools was so important. But we have to sustain those investments over time. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it's 11 years, typically, between the onset of symptoms uh, and when a child ultimately gets treatment. We have to shorten that time frame. We can't let kids struggle and their families struggle for 11 years. And getting care to them where they are in schools is one important way to help do that. I totally agree. And then the second piece of that is that after they've been identified, they're getting help in school. If there's no community-based care, then it all drops off, which is why, as we talk about um, certified community behavioral health clinics, this is about institutionally creating parity in the community between physical health clinics and behavioral health clinics. And that's why this movement, I'm so uh, proud that uh, Senator Blunt has joined me in this and uh, members of our committee, certainly the chairman and the work that's been done in Oregon and this is really uh, significant. We have a broad bipartisan bill to extend the opportunity across the country, which is absolutely critical because first, um, you have to have services in the community. The services that are being provided now in places with funding are providing services to children. We know that about 25% of the services now being provided through the behavioral health clinics are to children and more can be done and they're working with uh, juvenile uh, delinquency facilities and criminal justice facilities and so on. Um, and the most important thing is that they are meeting people where they are, meeting children where they are. Traditionally now, the mental health system has taken only those who are very seriously mentally ill under Medicaid. This is about everyone who presents themselves, every parent who presents themselves at a clinic with their child, and they're required to be able to get access to services and, and so on within a week, which is transformative, uh, as well as the, the psychiatric crisis services provided. So I wonder if you might speak more uh, about uh, what we have dubbed the CCBHCs, it's a mouthful, but um, dealing with behavioral health for services and the important role of community-based services. Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have treatment accessible to people in their communities. Um, and ideally to have that combined uh, with the virtual care services to provide maximal points of access. Um, mental health is, is a delicate issue for many families and being able to go to places and people they trust is often essential. Knowing that there's a center in your community can make a big difference for someone who's wondering whether they should step forward and get care. But what's also important is that the care that's delivered, uh, whether it's for mental health concerns or substance use disorders is actually evidence-based care uh, which is why I believe the CCBHCs and the standards that they are working to uphold, such that all evidence-based treatment is being made available, uh, is, is very important. Uh, and so I, my, my hope is that through a combination of in-person services and virtual services, 
we can ultimately provide the network uh, of access uh, that young people need uh, to get the health care they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Stabenow is going to continue to pioneer in this area since she's taken on the workforce issue, which we all know is absolutely crucial. So we look forward to her continuing her good work. Uh, Senator Grassley is next. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on your appointment to this very important position. I'm going to ask some questions about legislation that I've uh, sponsored and how it's being implemented. And so if you don't know the details of that, you can answer in writing, but let me ask you anyway. I'm going to start out with this lead in. I passed the bipartisan ACE Kids Act with the uh, cooperation of Senator Bennett of this committee. It aligns Medicaid rules and payments to incentivize care coordination, including mental health care for kids with complex medical conditions. This Congress, I'm working with Senator Bennett again to pass the Accelerating Kids Access to Care to streamline access to out-of-state providers for these same kids and their families. My uh, question is this. The Accelerating Kids Access to Care builds uh, onto the ACE Kids uh, law that's now on the books by cutting red tape for providers and families. As a health care provider, is access to an out-of-state provider a challenge for farmer, families who have children with complex medical needs? And uh, let me add a second question so you can answer them both at one time. How important is it that a child have mental health support services coordinated with their physical health? Well, Senator, thank you for that question and for your leadership on this issue. I uh, couldn't agree with you more that we need to reduce the barriers uh, to people getting care, including from out-of-state providers. One of the things that, the, that we saw during the pandemic was that there were emergency measures uh, that were put in place that allowed people uh, to essentially provide care across state lines uh, and that also allowed for the greater use and adoption of telemedicine. I think we shouldn't go back on some of those measures. Uh, I think the more we're able to ensure uh, that people can get care uh, from wherever they need, uh, whether it's in their state or out of state, uh, the better kids will be. Uh, and finally, this is not just about children, it's about their families. As you know uh, better than most, Senator, uh, from the work you have done, when kids have complex medical conditions, uh, that creates certain stresses for their family at large. Uh, that's not always easy for parents to handle while also juggling their jobs. We've got to make this easier for parents, not harder. Uh, and allowing uh, those families to be able to get the best quality care wherever it is, uh, is a key part of that process. Uh, thank you for that. I'd, uh, in my state of Iowa and even some states further west that are less populated, uh, mental health in rural areas is a very important thing. So I want to ask about rural youth. Your 53-page youth mental advisory mentions youth in rural areas that they are at higher risk of mental health challenges as they may face additional challenges in participating in school or access to mental health services. The advisory does not speak to specific resources for youth living in rural America. Uh, could you explain why that might not be included? Uh, and maybe give me a short answer to that so I can ask for a longer answer on my last question. Oh, sure, Senator. Well, the advisory by nature, these are, are limited documents that are intended to call out challenges and lay out actions that people can take. Uh, you are absolutely right that we need more resources for youth in rural areas. There are some governmental resources uh, that are under development, like the 988 uh, hotline. There are private platforms, like Crisis Text Line, which currently serve many youth in rural areas. Uh, but this is one of the disparities in health that I'm worried about, uh, is that in rural areas, it is harder for children to get the care they need. Okay. Um, my last question, I helped pass the Seeding Rural Resilience Act with Senator Tester. The law requires the U.S. Department of Agriculture to work with HHS, including the Surgeon General, to raise mental health awareness among farmers and ranchers. Can you work with the, your USDA colleagues to ensure that this effort is developing as urgently as possible and report back to me? 
Yes, Senator, I would be happy to do that. Uh, I think uh, I'll submit the rest of my questions for answer in, in right. Thank, thank you very much, Senator Grassley. We're going to be calling some audibles because members have hectic schedules. I think now Senator Carper is available online, and uh, if he didn't hear it, we wanted to give a special shout-out to Senator Carper because he is making a personal commitment to standing up for kids as they kind of win their way through the mental health system. Senator Carper. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. General, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for, uh, for, for your service. I, uh, I want to, um, and th thank you for, for joining us today and for your, for your testimony. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, our chairman, uh, Senator Wyden, uh, for the opportunity to serve as a co-chairman of this bipartisan working group uh, on the mental health. I'm delighted to be chairing the pediatrics and young people portion of this effort with our friend and colleague, uh, uh, Senator Cassidy. The uh, pediatric uh, mental health crisis is not a challenge that this committee can meet uh, by its, itself. Uh, but for those of us in this room working with others who share our vision, uh, like you, Dr. Murthy, we, we can forge the way. And I believe that, uh, that we'll do just that. And in one of my first acts as governor, I established something called the Family Services Cabinet Council devoted to strengthening families, the basic building block of our society. The goal of our council was united about five different departments across the, 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 uh, the government of uh, the state of Delaware. Our goal was to focus on prevention, root causes, so that rather than spending our resources treating the symptoms of our problems uh, relating to, to families, we would attack the root causes of those problems. And uh, General, in your opening uh, statement, you mentioned that investing in schools and community-based programs that have been shown to improve mental health and emotional well-being of children at the low cost and high benefit. And my question, simple question, would be how can Congress further build on these preventive and effective services? Well, well Senator, it's good to see you, and thank you for that question about prevention. Uh, I'm particularly grateful for it because I think historically, uh, as a health system, we have focused the lion's share of our attention and energy on treatment uh, and not so much on prevention. And we're seeing the consequences of that in, with mental health. Uh, about 75% uh, you know, of people who struggle with mental illness, uh, their struggles appear uh, before the age uh, of 24. And we, so we've got to get to, to kids early. Now, the good news is that within the CDC and NIH, there are a number of programs that have been supported and funded over the years uh, and research that is ongoing that has demonstrated that there are, in fact, programs prevention programs, school and community-based, that are effective uh, at reducing the likelihood of mental health challenges down the line and are also cost-effective. Uh, the Family Checkup Program is one of those examples. Uh, when I was Surgeon General uh, in, a prior, in the Obama administration, I had also published a report on, on alcohol, drugs, and health, which laid out an entire chapter on prevention-based programs that work not only to reduce substance use disorders, but also uh, mental health challenges for young people including programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, good, the Good Behavior Games uh, program, uh, and others like that. The challenge we have right now, Senators, is, is these programs are often underfunded, understudied, and underappreciated by the public. I have talked to many educators uh, over the last few years um, who, if they have heard of these programs, don't know how to go about beginning to implement them. So this is a place where I do believe resources and technical assistance can make a big difference and helping our kids early uh, in, the, in the time course of these challenges. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, the Family Services Cabinet Council that, uh, that we established in Delaware, which uh, Governor John Carney has resurrected, uh, among the things that, uh, that we did, we, we uh, as, again, we focused hugely on symptoms, uh, not on the symptoms we found, but root causes. One of the things we found out in, in working with uh, the, uh, uh, actually the, 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 the faith community uh, in uh, Kent County, uh, for uh, providing for the education of uh, kids in schools who have literally been thrown out of school because of violence and disruption. And uh, rather than just say, well, we're going to send you back home and sit it out, uh, we actually provided alternatives for them. One of those was with a, a church just north of, of Dover, African-American pastor, large church, and they have created an alternative uh, educational program for, for students with remarkably good results. Kids that just couldn't perform, couldn't behave at all in school, uh, middle school, high school uh, students. 
And I, I remember visiting the, uh, the, 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 the church in the school, which was right side by side the church. And I said to the pastor of the church, I said, uh, what is, uh, what is, what's a problem with these kids? What is the problem with these kids that, you know, they're showing up at your doorstep and being sent by school? She said, the problem with these kids is nobody loves them. That's what she said. She said, the problem with these kids is nobody loves them. She said, too many of them don't have a father around, will never have a father around, and they just need to be loved and have someone who has high expectations for them. That, uh, and you know what? Uh, we went to work on that. We just went to work on that and focused on, among other things, training, uh, partnering with thousands of, uh, of, of parents uh, in, in uh, neighborhoods across, uh, across our state, offering in-home parenting service, doing the same thing in our prisons doing the same thing in, in, in our prison. So I've got some questions for, for the record that I'm going to submit to, to you. But I, I would just say to you, we can, we can uh, uh, address the symptoms of these problems, uh, but if that's all we do and we don't go after root causes, which are many and varied, but I mentioned a couple of the big ones, and that I would submit that one of my priorities and then my, one of my joys in, in taking on this, uh, this opportunity is, is to do just that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, we look forward to working with all of you. General, great to see you. Thanks, my friend. Thank, thank you, Senator Carper, and I'm so glad that you're taking this on with, uh, with Senator Cassidy. Both of you have a long tradition of working in a bipartisan way, and this issue is so crucial. It's exactly what we're going to need. Uh, Senator Thune is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Dr. Murthy, and uh, thanks, uh, Chair uh, and uh, Senator Crapo, for addressing this subject. This uh, is a subject that is increasingly on the minds of administrators and teachers, um, parents and students across the country. Uh, very real when you talk to school administrators, just the uptick, the statistics don't lie. Um, clearly, uh, these mental health issues are having a tremendous impact on young people uh, to the point that they are, in many cases, taking extreme uh, measures. And, um, and, and, and we hate to see what's happening to, uh, to our, our youth across America. I, I want to ask one question. This is a controversial subject, and I know it, but we're in the third year of the pandemic. Fatigue is uh, with public health measures is set in. We know a lot more about this than we did in 2020 in March, and yet communication is still confusing and in some cases inconsistent, and I think it's undermined Americans' confidence in public health officials. Specifically, uh, HHS has pushed a toddler mask mandate and Head Start programs in the U.S., including outside on the playground. Not even the WHO was recommending masking kids under five, and at the end of last year, President Biden said pandemic response needs to be at the state level. Um, yet the administration is taking the decision out of the hands of folks on the ground, and there are a number of states who are announcing now that they're going to do away with mass mandates in their state. So I, I know this is a, again, I said it's a, it's a, it's, it probably requires a lot more time than we have, but could you just tell me where the science is on this, on mass, and, and, and what should it be? Should it be a federal government thing, or should the states be able to make these decisions on their own? Well, Senator, I appreciate that question. And I think you're exactly right to point out the fact that year three going into this pandemic, there are a lot of people who are frustrated, who are tired, uh, who are exhausted. And, and I think we've got to, to keep, take that into account as we think about the next stages of, of the response. When it comes to masks, Senator, what we know, what we've learned in the last few years in particular, is that masks are a helpful tool to help reduce spread uh, of the virus. When we look at schools, in fact, that have masking, there is less spread and there are in fact fewer school closures as a result of there being less spread of the infection. Now, do, do parents in an ideal setting want their kids in masks? No parent would want a mask if it's not needed. Um, but I think what our goal should be is to get to a place where we can pull back on these uh, types of restrictions as often, as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. And in that process, there will be, uh, I think, a very important role that states and localities play in tailoring uh, the approach based on their individual uh, community circumstances. I think increasingly, finally, as we look at this pandemic, we see uh, that we have more tools now uh, to help address the pandemic, to give people, to empower people, rather, uh, to keep themselves safe, whether those are masks or therapeutics, uh, vaccines and boosters. Uh, and uh, increasing supply of tests. These are all tools now that we can use to live our lives more normally uh, than we did two years ago. 
I think it's just for per parents, kids, everybody, very frustrating, and I hope that we can get to a point, and I, and I agree, I, mean, I think states need to be um, tasked and enabled and empowered to make a lot of those decisions. Uh, uh, changing gears quickly, telehealth, um, I've got a, we've got a couple of bills. I've got one with Senator Men Menendez that would incentivize states to pursue certain health services uh, initiatives under CHIP, providing greater flexibility to states that design initiatives to address behavioral health in schools and we look forward to working with you on that. But a number of these solutions now include, um, you know, within Medicaid and CHIP, telehealth. Do you think that's been a, a valuable thing? Uh, in my state, we have uh, Aval School Health provides access to a school nurse and behavioral health services remotely where the workforce is not available. And we all talk about the need for more providers, which we don't have. But it seems to me at least telehealth is, uh, can make a big difference there. Would you agree? Absolutely, Senator. I think telehealth has to be part of our healthcare delivery apparatus going forward. I think the pandemic has helped us see how powerful it can be in increasing access to care. I think this is particularly helpful for rural areas uh, where people currently often have to drive many miles uh, to see a mental health provider if there even is one uh, in their area. So I absolutely think we have to implement it. That means expanding access to broadband. It means ensuring that we reimburse adequately for those services and that we have appropriate privacy measures in place for patients. Thank you. Finally, um, the, the big tech companies influence on young people today. We've seen all kinds of analysis and uh, investigations and reporting on that. There are, uh, for example, a Wall Street Journal detailed how TikTok's algorithm serves up highly inappropriate video to minors. Um, I've got a bill that addresses that would give consumers the option to engage with internet platforms without being manipulated by opaque algorithms. And just a quick question, do you agree that users should be able to use social media without being manipulated by algorithms that are designed to keep them engaged on the platform for hours on end? Well, Senator, I do believe that people should be able to use social media without being manipulated, without having their data uh, used in ways uh, that they do not consent to. And I think all of us, particularly parents and children, uh, deserve to have the data that technology companies have about the impacts of these technologies on our children. Uh, currently, there is a grand national experiment that is taking place upon our kids uh, with, when it comes to social media. And we need to understand more about what is happening, which kids are at risk, what impact these algorithms uh, and the broader platforms are having on our children. Uh, so we need to understand that so that parents can make informed decisions uh, for their children. Okay. A big part of this uh, problem, and I think one of our challenges, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in addressing mental health issues is the influence of a lot of these um, algorithms that manipulate the content that people, and particularly young people, see online. Thank you. I, I think your point uh, is important. Uh, Senator Booker and I introduced the Algorithm Accountability Act, which really <laughs> speaks to the proposition that so often people think algorithms are just purely computer science, nobody's biases and the like. I think we've come to learn that is not always the case, that people bring their biases to the construction of these algorithms. Look forward to working with you on it. Senator Portman is next. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Dr. Murthy, I appreciate you being here and the work you've done on this topic of uh, mental health and behavioral health more broadly for our, our, our kids. Uh, I looked at your recommendations uh, for communities. One was that responding to mental health crises for young people should involve implementing evidence-based programs at the community level. And you cite what's called the Drug-Free Communities Act as an example of that. Um, I'm happy to see that because I do believe that that's part of the answer here is to not just break down social isolation but also deal with the, with the drug issue and its interaction with mental health. And um, I'm the author of that legislation years ago but also started my own coalition back home that's, that's still very active and, and I'm involved with. Can you elaborate on how drug use prevention intersects with mental health and in particular talk about how that investment in prevention might keep people from using or abusing drugs um, starting uh, at, at a young age? Well, Senator, first, thank you for your leadership on this issue. I know you've been a champion uh, you know, in addressing the addiction crisis in America, and uh, we need that kind of leadership, especially because during this pandemic, we have seen overdose deaths increase to their highest levels. Uh, I'm also glad that you raised a point about prevention. Uh, when, in 2016, when I published the Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, uh, I had devoted an entire chapter to prevention programs, most of which were school or community-based. 
And the powerful thing about those programs, Senator, was that they not only helped to reduce the likelihood that children would develop a substance use disorder down the line, but they also improved mental health outcomes. They improved graduation rates. They reduced teen pregnancies. They had a multiple, multiple benefit uh, to, to the kids who participated in them. The other important point is that these were cost-effective programs, Senator. Uh, they saved somewhere between 2 to $11 for every $1 that was invested in them. Uh, I think we need more of these programs, not less. I think we need to provide not only more funding but more technical assistance to schools and communities to implement these programs. I think prevention is always better uh, than cure, and we have a lot more prevention that we can do. Well, thank you for your work on that, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on the prevention side. You're absolutely right in terms of the efficiency of it and the cost. Uh, it's it's a absolutely the best way to deal with the issue. We also do a lot of work, as you know, on the treatment and longer-term recovery issues, which are necessary. Uh, but prevention, I think, is, re remains the, the most uh, effective and has the most potential. On social isolation, you talked earlier about in-person learning. I'm, I'm very big on getting our kids back to school uh, because of the data that I've seen about uh, what that does to a child not to have that interaction with their classmates and, and, and with their teachers. One of the things we've heard in Ohio is that um, you know, people want to get their kids back to school, and schools are, are for the most part in Ohio, uh, responding to that. 87% of Ohio schools were open for five-day in-person learning as of May 2021. Unfortunately, during uh, Omicron, that, that number decreased. But they've talked about testing. Uh, they have said that there is inadequate testing as a contributing factor that prevents them from holding in-person learning. CDC has put forward this test to stay strategy, which uses uh, contact tracing and serial testing to allow kids to stay in school. Um, can you talk a little about that? With about 55 million kids enrolled in school around the country, uh, that's, that's a lot of tests. But I think it's absolutely essential we get them back to school. And can you speak to the effectiveness of this test to stay strategy and the scale of testing resources that would be needed to successfully implement that nationwide? Well, thanks, Senator. I, I couldn't agree with you more that getting our kids back to school is essential. My children were not in school in 2020 during the pandemic. They, in the fall of 2021, were able to go back to school. It has made a huge difference for them and also for me and my wife as parents. Uh, I think in order to keep our kids in school, you're, uh, I appreciate you pointing out the test to stay program. There are several things that can actually help our kids stay in school. One is basic prevention measures uh, can be useful to reduce the overall likelihood of infection. Second, uh, when kids are vaccinated, uh, per the CDC's quarantine rules, they also do not need to leave school if they are exposed. Um, they can uh, mask and then they can be tested. Um, but third, you know, even if children are not vaccinated, the test to stay program is a series of regular tests that allow them to stay. What the administration has done, recognizing exactly what you said, that tests, more tests are needed to implement that, uh, that program for some schools, is they have doubled, in fact, the number of tests that they have made available to send to schools. And we have also, more broadly for the country, increased the overall number of rapid tests that are available, with the president announcing about a month ago uh, one billion tests that would be able, available to deliver uh, directly to homes, as well as additional tests that we were uh, commissioning to be produced for the broader community. Uh, so if there are schools or communities that are, are struggling, need access to test center, I'd be happy to follow up with you afterward mm -hmm. and find out how to connect them to the right resources in the federal government so they can get the tests that they need. Yeah, we'd love to follow up with you on that as it relates to Ohio. And again, uh, thanks for your service. Thank you, sir. Senator Cardin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Murthy, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for your service to our country. We really appreciate that. Appreciate uh, I just really first want to concur in the comments that have been made by our chairman and ranking member uh, in regards to mental health parity. We've had some great moments uh, moving forward, and yet there's still a lot more that we need to accomplish in regards to mental health parity. Uh, I appreciate the recommendations that are being made here. Uh, and I want to start with the recommendation to expand the use of telehealth for mental health challenges, addressing the regulatory barriers, ensuring appropriate payment, and expanding broadband access, all of which I, I agree with. But here, I think, is the challenge that we have. We've worked bipartisan to expand telehealth on this committee. We did it uh, as a necessity during COVID-19, and now as we're coming out of COVID-19, we would like to make permanent changes in our healthcare system that permits the broader use of telehealth. It's particularly helpful for mental health, but other services as well. 
And one of the challenges is that when we go to do this, we're told that there will be an extra cost to the healthcare system in using telehealth, which is counterintuitive. Telehealth is much more efficient for direct healthcare costs, let alone the indirect costs to the patient who has to travel and maybe take, get a hotel room or whatever else is involved in a, a, a in-person visit. So how can you help us in um, the data we need to show that telehealth is not just more convenient, it's not just increasing access to people who would otherwise not get access, but it's also more cost efficient to our healthcare system. Well, Senator, I, I think you raise a really important point because we have to look at the costs globally. Uh, and just as you said, when a, I, I talk to providers all the time who tell me what's not working uh, about our current healthcare system, I'll say one of the most common examples, Senator, I hear about is the, the doctor who says, I need to call my patients and ask them to come in to give them lab results, even though I could just tell them on the phone because the system doesn't adequately allow me uh, to have those kind of virtual uh, care type appointments. When something like that happens, a patient is taking time off from work to come in, a clinician is spending time in person and with office staff supporting, et cetera. Uh, you've got more time spent that doesn't need to be spent, time that can be saved, and time is money for individuals, for patients, as well as for, uh, you know, for the office staff. So I think when you look at the cost globally, it makes sense, it is more efficient for us to use technology as an adjunct. Uh, to me, it would be not, not that different from saying that it's more efficient to be able to call a relative or a friend rather than go and visit them at their house every time you wanna say hello or have a question. Um, technology can make things more efficient. I think what's critical though, as you mentioned, is we have to use it appropriately. We have to ensure that practices are set up uh, to use settlement medicine appropriately. We have to reimburse uh, for it adequately. We have to make sure that it has privacy measures in place. And from an equity perspective, we have to expand broadband access so that everybody has access. To oh, I, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I also think we have to educate those who are doing the scorekeeping here to explain that when we make our healthcare system more efficient, it saves money. It doesn't add to the cost. I want to ask you one additional question. I have a little bit more time. And that is uh, the number one issue I hear from our healthcare providers today is workforce, workforce, workforce. They just don't have enough individuals in any one of these capacities. And certainly in mental health, we don't have the adequate workforce that we need in order to provide the services. That's been even highlighted in a much more severe manner as a result of COVID-19 with increased demands and less workforce that is available. But there's a chronic shortage in underserved communities because we don't have the diversity in the mental health providers that we desperately need. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that you would be forceful in, in recommendations, not just to increase the workforce in mental health, but to increase the opportunities so that we have a workforce that represents our community. In that regard, I would make a strong recommendation to engage the HBCUs and MSIs and institutions that can reach out and offer opportunities to traditionally underserved communities. Thank you, Senator. I couldn't agree with you more about the diversity of the workforce. I remember being in Maryland at Morgan State when I was Surgeon General last time talking about the workforce diversity issues we have when it comes to substance use disorder uh, treatment and the similar disparities we are seeing and gaps when it comes to mental health care treatment. I think there are a number of measures that we can take from loan forgiveness to much more effective recruitment uh, of racial and ethnic minorities into the workforce from early on in the education system. And this is critical because as you mentioned, this is gonna help us provide better care to the communities uh, across America if we have a more diverse workforce. Well, I look forward to working with you on that. I'll be at Morgan on uh, Friday, assuming we're not here. Uh, there, there, it's an incredible resource, not just for the students they educate, but for our community at, all, at large in providing opportunities to underserved communities. And I think they can play a role, as other HBCUs can play a role in helping us meet these needs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cardin. I'm sorry I had to be out of the room for a minute, but I just I just want everyone to understand. Let me repeat everything. I just well, <laughs> I'm just going to take note of the fact that you have been 
advocating for these issues since your days in the Maryland legislature on the House Ways and Means Committee. We partnered often. And thank you for taking on um, some of the communications issues with Senator Thune. That's going to be really important. And um, you might be interested, Dr. Murthy, one of the responses we got with respect to the hearing on telehealth was the number of communities that are still lacking broadband worried that they're going to get it anytime soon. And they said, by the way, and I'll be telling Senator Cardin and Senator Thune about this, if you have to, just get us audio only until we get to the point where we have broadband. So we've got a lot to do. Senator Langford's here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your service to the country on it. I've got a ton of questions. Let me start trying to be able to run through some of them. Your report references children who lost a parent to COVID-19, which has been dramatic for us in Oklahoma, obviously. Uh, we've had a lot of children that have lost a parent. Bereavement's a very real issue dealing with mental health issues for children. Uh, somewhere around 15 to 20 percent, we're still getting the exact numbers in, of children that have lost a parent, lost a parent to COVID-19 which would mean 80 to 85% of the children that have lost a parent lost their parent to something else on this. So my question is for your report on just the focus here of how we deal with bereavement and children. How do we keep this as a broader focus and not just make this a COVID-19 focus uh, in particular? Uh, because obviously we're gonna get through COVID-19 together on all this. We're still gonna have the other issues of cancer and suicide and so many other issues where children deal with, with bereavement. How do we keep that broader perspective? Well, Senator, I, I appreciate you broadening the lens there because you're right. Uh, many of our kids have been struggling losing a caregiver before the pandemic, and this is going to be a challenge for right. us post pandemic. I think there are a few things I think that are important right now. Uh, as you know, there is there are federal funds that are provided often to support um, the services uh, for foster care and for other services that kids may need when they lose a caregiver. And while I think there is more that we can do legislatively, uh, Senator, in terms of providing more support to those local institutions that provide the safety net for kids, right. I think this is a time also where, in addition to the government, uh, we need communities to pull together around these kids. Uh, you, these kids aren't just going to need help for a few months or for a year. Yeah, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. Uh, and the trauma also that goes into the loss of a caregiver is extraordinary. We're learning more and more, Senator, as you know, about uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences and the impact of that trauma on the long-term health of a child. Having trauma-informed care, ensuring our healthcare providers are trained in how to address trauma uh, early on in the provision of care, making sure schools have counselors that are also uh, attuned to how to provide trauma-based care. This is gonna be essential to caring for this. It'll be a big deal for us long-term. Neighborhoods, communities, extended family, churches, yes. we've gotta have a whole uh, engagement within communities for this. But one of the things that we need to be able to look at as a committee, and that I'd love to be able to partner with HHS on how we actually fill the gap is, I've learned about 50% of the kids that have lost a parent uh, are not getting their social security benefits uh, based on that. And so we've got to be able to find a way to be able to make sure that we're getting some of that support uh, to them. And that's something that I'd like to be able to partner together on. So, um, your, your report also, as mentioned, dealing with marijuana use in children. Uh, we've seen substance abuse go down in several areas uh, during COVID-19. The exception has been marijuana use that has gone up. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of factors on that. Obviously, the availability. So many different states have, have found ways to be able to make marijuana legal in their state. Uh, but for youth and adolescents, this has become a very serious issue. You've made some comments on this. I'd be interested to be able to drill down on the effects with youth and marijuana use and depression. Yes, Senator. So when it comes to youth, I, I, I worry that there is a perception uh, that marijuana is completely harmless in children. Um, our data tells us otherwise. Uh, our data tells us that in fact that uh, a portion, a substantial minority of people who use marijuana will actually develop uh, an addiction to marijuana. And that number is significantly higher uh, among youth. Uh, when kids also have underlying mental health conditions, uh, the impact of marijuana use can also uh, be more significant. And so I worry, Senator, about the messages that we may send that say this is utterly harmless and there's no problem here. I think we need to be responsible in how we teach our kids about marijuana. I think how we talk to families uh, about marijuana use. Uh, and I think healthcare providers uh, also need to be empowered to have these conversations with youth early on, as well as teachers. 
Yeah. Uh, we, we've got to find a way to get that message out. That message is not getting out. Uh, obviously, they're, they're seeing the role models of other individuals using marijuana, and, and there doesn't seem to be any voice that's out there talking about the real damage in youth uh, in this area, especially, and how they deal with depression and other issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a, a challenging set of questions I want to be able to walk through as well on it dealing with another mental health I issue and long-term effects, and it deals with a gender dysphoria uh, among children especially, and how we process this on the medical side. So puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, uh, receiving uh, surgical procedures to att attempt to change the appearance uh, from your biological sex among children. There have been some studies that have happened, but there's also studies around the world that are raising new questions for adolescents in those areas and saying you've got someone 13, 12, 14 years old that are taking some of these medications. Long term, they have serious effects. Um, and when you're dealing with a 12 or 13 year old, what is the standard for them actually when they're living with those consequences when they're 20, 30, 40? And is there a responsibility to be able to put some warnings out and some precautions in this? How do we manage through that right now on a medical side? Well, Senator, I appreciate you raising this. I mean, these are, this is a very complex issue, as you know well. And I think what families need at a point like this is they need clear guidance from the medical community. I think as the research has evolved and as uh, as guidance is evolving on how best to take care uh, of children in these circumstances. Uh, you know, one of the things I worry about is that change propagates slowly uh, in the medical profession. Uh, with the time from when you make a discovery, for example, to when it completely uh, reflected in clinical practice often takes years. We can't afford uh, that kind of time frame here. We've got to do a better job putting our best minds together in government and outside of government in terms of medical uh, expertise to figure out how best to care for these kids and make sure then that caregivers and families uh, have that information as well. We've got more work to do there. Yeah, we do. I, I don't want the politics today to get in the way of just sound medical advice. Uh, to also make information available and a lot of unknowns that are there or in what is known in other countries are now stepping up and saying, hey, we're learning more and there are real problems that are here with infertility and other issues that are there with depression and other things uh, with youth long term that we can't just ignore based on the politics of the conversation that we lose the health issues. So we, we need you to give us good health information in that area. Absolutely. And Senator, I've always believed something I, I was taught in my first days of medical school that science and compassion are what should guide care. Those two things, uh, not politics, not opinions, not bias, but science and compassion. We've got to bring the benefit of science, deliver that compassionately to families thank, during a time that can be good. Thank, thank, thank you, you Senator, Senator Langford. Um, colleagues, what we're going to do is we're going to keep this going. Um, I know a number of colleagues just raced in because the door opened so quickly and almost blew me out of the room with your enthusiasm, and I thank you for it. Let's go next to Senator Cassidy. We're just going to keep going. And um, just so we know, Senator Cassidy has been the linchpin around here to doing something bipartisan in health. When we got the bipartisan prescription drug bill out in the last Congress, it was Senator Cassidy who was bringing people together. Senator, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Mr. Wyden, and thank you, Dr. Murthy. Uh, man, just for a second, you and I are going to be doctors once more in a, in a literature kind of review session, okay? Um, there is an article that just came out, Literature Review and Meta-Analysis on the Effects of Lockdowns on COVID-19 Mortality, Studies in Applied Economics coming out of Johns Hopkins. Prestigious institution, prestigious, well-accomplished authors, and doing a meta-analysis of, I think, 16 different studies. In fairness, it's not peer-reviewed, but it's pretty good. Now, a couple things. They spoke about non-pharmaceutical interventions. And one thing they say, they use it to describe any government mandate which directly restrict people's possibilities, not including information campaigns, mass testing, social distancing, but including closing schools or businesses, mandated face masks, et cetera. So pretty broad. Now, they found no statistical correlation. Let me, in fact, let me read the second paragraph of their... With this meta-analysis concludes that lockdowns have had little to no public health effects. They have imposed enormous economic and social costs where they have been adopted. In consequence, lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. Now, we speak of science guiding what we do. 
Clearly, we've seen that children have suffered, both in terms of learning loss and the lack of a detection of their possible mental health issues, physical health issues, et cetera. I think I know that you've opposed school shutdowns. Is that a fair statement? And what do you think in general of what these uh, economists out of Johns Hopkins suggest that what government has done, well-intentioned and without having facts, but in, that, but in turn, as it turns out, uh, worsened the situation, particularly for child mental health, as opposed to improving? And by the way, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I, I'd like to submit this for the record. Yeah, with, with, without objection, also I'll put into the record at this time, in January of this year, 2022, 95% of public elementary and medical schools were open and engaged in in-person learning compared to 46% of schools in January 2021. So just wanted to put both of those um, documents into the record at this time. And then I, I believe uh, Dr. Cassidy had a question for Dr. Murthy. And you're going to extend my time, right? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> took 15 seconds. And we're, we're going to get Senator Hassan and Senator Warren in with a little lock. Oh, okay. Senator Cassidy, thank you for that. And I always appreciate our chance, opportunities to talk as doctors uh, and, and to think about uh, medicine in a human way. I think we've learned a lot during this pandemic. And I think one of the things that we learned early on is that in 2020, first year of the pandemic, where there were many blunt measures taken, um, like uh, you know taking kids out of school, for example, uh, being the most clearest example, uh, what I think we've realized is that, yes, those did have significant harms to our kids. My kids, my two kids, were among the millions of children who were not in school in 2020 as a result of the pandemic restrictions. Let me tell you, it was hard on my kids. It was hard on their family, uh, on my wife and I, too. Uh, but now that our kids are back in school, and, you know, as of fall 2021, and 95-plus percent of children uh, were in or schools were open for in-person learning starting in fall 2021, that has had an of enormous benefit uh, to our kids. And I think our responsibility is to keep learning from the data, learning from these experiences, to approach these types of public health emergencies with a scalpel rather than with a blunt end. I agree with you. I'm limited to time, but let me just assert, should there be another variant, which is more, uh, maybe as infectious, but more virulent than Omicron, we need to learn from this and not claim it as an excuse to shut down, but to recognize the best evidence is that it, the cost-benefit ratio it's too costly for the marginal benefit. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, so I think we should do everything possible to keep our schools open, even with Omicron, uh, Senator, even though it was more transmissible, we were advocating for schools to stay open and to use a safety measure. So if there's a place. shortage of testing, as there is currently a shortage of testing, nonetheless, would a school feel comfortable? The best science suggests they should stay open even if they cannot test? Well, so if a school does not have access to safety uh, layers of precaution, whether that's tests, masks, you know, if they're worried about the ventilation, if they can't, if they don't feel that it's safe. Uh, but, ah, but the non-pharmaceutical intervention did not find benefit from uh, those measures. And you're hedging a little bit, doctor. Uh, no, I, I, well, let me tell you, I'm giving nuance here because this is a nuanced thing. It's not black and white. Like when you, if you get, to get kids back in school, you need teachers in school too. If teachers are worried about their health, if parents are worried about the health of their children, then you need to have a conversation with I them. I accept that, but right. doesn't it seem wise that the federal government be consistent in their message to those teachers so that they, like a clear bell ringing, the single, single note is, you can safely go back to school and the cost-benefit ratio favors being in? Because you, you certainly get mixed messages from the federal government, I'll say that. So, Senator, I would agree, and I, I would... Uh, Can I jump ahead because I got... Oh, please, go ahead. Of course. Because yeah. we actually, on this, this change topics, mm -hmm. um, Medicaid provides a heck of a lot of mental health services for people. The quality data we get from states, shall we say, is not sterling. Mm -hmm. It is awful. I'm a gastroenterologist. You can imagine which term comes to mind. Um, so my point being, that's something we have control over, which would be to demand that states comply with something that was originally in Obamacare. I think it was Obamacare, right? TMSIS? Comply with TMSIS in terms of getting good data on longitudinal outcomes for the children they have identified with mental illness, receiving Medicaid reimbursement for either that or addiction services, and to see how that state is doing. Knowing that's beyond your purview in one sense, but is that a policy that you think would be wise? Well, Senator, I, I, I do think a lack of data is a huge problem. It's like you're flying blind if you don't understand what's actually happening uh, in your community. So I think any steps that we can take to ensure we have accurate and timely uh, data will help us to better 
sharpen our policies. So, and, and Mr. Chair, uh, just because it's to you, I'm speaking right now, of course, because you're the man with the gavel. Uh, I hear anecdotally around the country that psychiatric services for Medicaid patients is extremely poor, both absence of providers, absence of good follow-up, et cetera. It may not be true, but we only know it until we see the data. And what we can do collectively to demand the states actually put it forward, because we've given them resources, is something we should do. I'm way over. Thank you, sir. And, and, and Senator, I just told the finance staff this will be an area we'll follow up with you, because there's no, no question that a big part of our work is going to be this debate. My sense is we'll need more revenue at some point for some of our objectives. But the first thing you ought to do is do a better job of spending what's out there. And to do a better job of spending what's out there, you got to have good data. We'll follow up with you. OK, Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the ranking member for this hearing. And to the Surgeon General, it's really good to see you. And thank you for being here. Uh, I have heard repeatedly, Dr. Murthy, from the parents of children who are struggling with mental health issues but can't access treatment. Even if the families have private insurance, their provider networks are inadequate, and the workforce can't meet what is now a crushing need for pediatric mental health services. Parents recount calling every provider in the region and being told that there are waits of four to six weeks for remote sessions and three to four weeks for inpatient programs. How do these long wait times affect children's mental health, and what can we do to ensure that children in need can find treatment? Well, Senator, it's good to see you again as well, and, and thank you for that question. I have heard those stories time and time again myself and over the years. Uh, and long wait times are troubling for multiple reasons. Uh, when a child is not able to see a provider in a timely way, that means more time that that child is struggling, not getting the help they need, uh, and potentially uh, at harm, uh, at risk of harm to themselves. But the other consequence is to their families, uh, to the parents of children who cannot get help. I'll tell you this, as a parent myself, there is no feeling worse than knowing that you cannot get your child the help he or she needs. That is the worst feeling for, for a parent. And there are millions of parents who are going through that because they see their child suffering, they can't get them uh, assistance. So that is why we have to close that gap. That is a, a, as much as a, about workforce as it is about using technology to provide adequate uh, care, as it is about making sure reimbursement is adequate so that we can support a health system with enough access. Thank you. Um, I also want to talk about what's going on in our schools a little bit here. Schools are our first responders to the youth mental health crisis, but they often lack sufficient personnel to help students manage mental health issues. One New Hampshire counselor shared her experience explaining, quote, my students are frustrated and feel as though they are on the back burner of care. It is assumed that now that children are back in school, the issues that they faced when at home will go away, but they're getting worse. We have minimal supports in the schools, close quote. So look, we need, no, we just talked about, we need to increase the number of mental health professionals generally, but we also need to really focus on increasing the number of mental health professionals in schools. But in the meantime, we have to ensure that teachers have the support that they need to address the crisis occurring in their classrooms today. How can we give educators the training, resources, and support that they need to continue helping our children during this mental health crisis? Such a good question. Senator, I have always felt that there are a lot of parallels between uh, healthcare workers and teachers. Yeah. Uh, they're both in the business of, of healing. And unfortunately, right now, uh, they've both been on the front lines of COVID, and they're burning out in extraordinary numbers. Um, I think supporting educators is going to be critical to supporting kids. And to do that, we, number one, have to make sure that the workload on educators is reasonable. What, is, what I have seen even in my children's school is that the educators have had to become public health experts overnight. They've had to make difficult decisions about everything from whether to invest in better ventilation, how frequently to do tests, to uh, how to help kids with their masks. This is on top of everything they were doing before. So we need more support for our educators. Part of the support that we need are more counselors and mental health professionals in our schools. Rather than expecting kids to go miles and miles away to where the care is, we've got to bring the care to kids. And finally, we've got to provide mental health support services for the educators themselves. Uh, they are under an extraordinary amount of stress and trauma. Uh, they need support, and we've got to bring that support to them as well. Right. 
And one of the things, too, though, I think, is we've got some models uh, when we're dealing, for instance, with substance use disorder uh, of some pilot programs that really have worked to help teachers understand what their students are perhaps going through if there's mm -hmm. substance misuse at, at home or if uh, an older student is experimenting with substances. So I think there are some parallels there, too, just to give teachers some basic tools. Um, let me turn to a topic uh, that I think is a growing concern. I hear about it from my constituents, um, but I also hear about it uh, from providers, that the increased use of social media by young people has accelerated the youth mental health crisis. However, as highlighted in your advisory statement, independent researchers face barriers when they are trying to access data from media companies. As a result, the relationship between digital technologies and mental health is really poorly understood. So how can we support research to better understand the impact of social media on youth mental health? Well, Senator, you're right to point this out. Like, uh, you know, I, we have a real problem with transparency now. Uh, right. these, our social media companies, other technology companies have data about how these platforms are impacting our children, about which kids are at greater risk. And our kids, do not, our independent researchers don't have access to this data. We have to, we need that data to be shared publicly, but we also need uh, safety standards. I think that's a very reasonable thing to consider here. We have safety standards for cars and for other consumer uh, uh, sort of goods. This is a, a tool, these platforms, that millions and millions of children are using. Um, we need to protect our kids, and that's where safety standards, I think, will be essential as well. There are researchers standing by at the ready who want to do the investigation, who want to look at the data, who want to help parents figure out how to protect their kids. They're handcuffed right now because they don't have access to that data. Okay. Thank you. I'd, I'd look forward to working with you on, on moving forward on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank my colleague. Senator Warner is next on, uh, on the web. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and Dr. Murthy, it's great to see you again, at least uh, remotely. Um, let me pick up on where my colleague, Senator Hassan, left off and um, about some of these online challenges. And I think Senator Thune mentioned this as well. Uh, I would say to my colleagues, we have uh, broadly bipartisan uh, legislation called the Detour Act that would prohibit um, the use of dark patterns, uh, not only for kids, but also for, for adults, of the ability of these platforms to kind of lure you in and no way to opt out. We've all seen, you know, click here and, and no other exit vehicle. Um, our legislation as well specifically prohibits uh, companies from using some of these manipulative features for, for children under 13. Uh, I know Dr. Murphy, you've already kind of addressed this, but uh, uh, this kind of legislation, I'm not, I don't want to be hitting you cold, you may not have seen it, but the idea of trying to look at the manipulative tools and dark patterns, I got to believe has got to be part of um, uh, this effort going forward. Well, Senator, it's, uh, it's good to see you virtually as well again. And I do think that there are potentially harmful tools and algorithms like on some of these platforms, which can lure young people further and further down harmful paths, um, which can, and that can have adverse impacts on their mental health and well-being. Um, we need to, to limit uh, kids' exposure to harmful content, and the algorithms, I think, are an important part of that. So I do think that this requires investigation. I do think that there are safety, this is an area where safety standards would be very helpful as well. Well, I, I appreciate that. And again, I would commend my colleagues, uh, Senator Fisher and and uh, Senator Thune on the Republican side have, have joined with me and Senator Klobuchar um, on this detour act. And as we make some movement here, um, looking at these dark patterns, looking at this kind of manipulative behavior, at least for kids, although I would argue it ought to extend to adults as well. Um, I think, again, topic that I think Senator Langford raised, and that's you know, one of the huge outgrowths of, of, um, of COVID-19, unfortunately, as we passed 900,000 deaths uh, just recently from COVID. As of November 2021, there are 167,000 children had lost a parent or a caregiver um, from COVID-19. And um, the, the truth is there's been a group put together called the Hidden Pain. And I would again urge my colleagues that going after uh, these kids who are gonna have special needs uh, because they've lost a parent or a caregiver. And, Obviously, there's huge mental health implications. Dr. Murthy, do you want to comment on, on that specific issue around uh, uh, kids who've lost their parent or caregiver? Senator, this is one of the most heartbreaking consequences of this pandemic. The trauma of losing a caregiver is hard to 
to put in words. It's one of the greatest traumas a child can go through. And the consequences of that loss uh, will be there not just for months, but for years. I think it is so important that as, not just as a government, but as a society that we are there for those kids, uh, whatever may come. Uh, I know that there are federal funds that ha are currently going towards supporting foster services and other services to support those youth that local and state government may, may incur. Um, but I think this goes beyond government as well, uh, to where thinking about how we ensure that healthcare providers and educators uh, understand how to provide a trauma-informed approach to education and care, because trauma is what these kids have gone through. I think it's also going to be essential to community organizations, from churches to synagogues uh, to YMCAs and others, uh, are able to, to step up and support these children, as many of them are doing already. Uh, but we're going to need that in the years going forward because they've experienced a tremendous loss. I agree, and I think we need a organized, uh, structured effort to support those efforts at the local level. My last question I want to raise with you, and this is not something that uh, uh, unfortunately just came around with COVID, and it's uh, frankly a challenge that has touched my family and um, probably many of my colleagues, and and uh, not directly with. Uh, Friends or friends or neighbors, and that is the enormous upsurge in challenges around eating disorders. Um, I've dealt with this for the last 12 to 14 years on a family basis, and have seen both the enormous growth of treatment centers. I've seen the enormous enormous growth of of uh, uh, boys, not just girls, but boys dealing with um, eating disorders. Obviously, um, this is a this problem in, in the litany of problems that have been exacerbated by COVID uh, is something I think we need to address. And, and I, I think a, a disproportionate number, my child's got a type one diabetic, adding eating disorder is huge. We've seen increased numbers of children of color, children of LD, uh, LGBTQ uh, kids. Um, can you, in your last 10 seconds or so, at least touch on that issue, which is something I think we are gonna have to continue to revisit. Absolutely, uh, Senator. And this is a place where we not only need uh, good care for kids struggling with eating uh, disorders. But this is where actually school counselors and mental health professionals in schools become so important because you want to catch the signs early. Uh, you don't want to wait years uh, or until severe health consequences have developed uh, you know, for uh, this to come to the attention of a, of a healthcare professional. Uh, finally, I'll just say this is a place also where it's so important for us to understand the impact of social media on our kids. We know that some children uh, have, when they have encountered content uh, that has made them more conscious of their body image in an unhealthy way uh, that may contribute uh, to eating use disorders. Uh, again, this is a place where the data where matters, transparency matters, and we've got to make sure the companies are providing that data so we best know how to protect our children. What, what Senator Warner is talking about is extraordinarily important, and I'm only moving on because we're going to try and see if we can get Senator Menendez. Senator Brown and Senator Cortez Mastow in before the Thank you, vote. Mr. Chairman. And we'll get, yes, he's before you too. Uh, okay, it goes Menendez, Brown, Bennett, Cortez Mastow. And we're going to see what we can do to get things helped. Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Murphy, welcome. The Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program is an evidence-based program so. that supports pregnant women and young families. This multi-year support is critical to having young people start off uh, their lives healthier and better prepared for early childhood learning. It also helps parents, including through mental health screenings and connecting to community-based resources. So my question is, how can we further support this program so that more young people are starting off on a strong footing and young parents, including pregnant and, pa and parenting foster youth, have an additional means of support? Well, Senator, I appreciate the question, and I do agree that these early intervention programs, especially that support families, uh, are absolutely essential. We have uh, more and more evidence that these kind of programs make a big difference, not just in the immediate setting, but for years down the line. Uh, and anything that I can do to, to work with you to support uh, these kind of efforts, I would be happy to do. I, I find that one of the challenges, Senator, is even when the programs are funded, that many communities don't know about them. 
mm -hmm. uh, and so they don't avail themselves uh, of the, the funds or they don't know what technical assistance is available to them to actually implement those programs. Um, but this is, these are incredibly important programs that help to reduce the risk of mental health challenges. Well, I, wel I welcome your support in the effort. McVeigh, as the program is known, uh, is uh, very successful, evidence-based, and so uh, we need to have advocates within the administration to uh, expand its opportunities. I, I want to take advantage of uh, my colleague, Senator Cortez Masto, being here. Uh, I introduced the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act along with Senator Cortez Mastos and Senator Booker because communities of color continue to disproportionately lack, uh, or suffer, I should say, from the lack of access to mental health services and supports. Do, do you support the need for targeted investments into minority communities that support access to culturally competent care? Senator, thank you for raising that. Mental health equity is and continues to be a profound challenge for our country. I do think we need to take a targeted approach here in the sense of surging resources uh, to communities that have been hard hit. The, the challenge that many of our communities of color have had is, uh, number one, from a workforce perspective, we don't have adequate representation of racial and ethnic minorities in our workforce. Uh, and that makes it more challenging when it comes to trust, uh, which is such an important component of getting good mental health care. But we also know that access has been a profound challenge uh, for many uh, of these communities. And we've got to make sure that we're uh, doing more than we are now to make sure that both virtual care and in-person care are available. Finally, Senator, as a member of uh, a racial and ethnic minority community, I will tell you that many of our communities struggle with stigma around a mental illness. Uh, it may come in different shapes and flavors, but that stigma is there in many of our communities, it prevents us from coming forward, which is again why role models uh, are so incredibly helpful. I, I, I strongly agree. I want to highlight the pandemic's impact on children from minority communities has been particularly harsh. Mm -hmm. And I want to take a moment to look at the impact on Latino communities in particular for a few moments. One survey found that 29% of Hispanic households with children have experienced three or more hardships during the pandemic, compared to around half of that for non-Hispanic white households with children. At the same time, Latino children were far more likely to experience the death of a primary caregiver during the pandemic and more likely to contract the virus and be hospitalized themselves. These experiences were compounded by other pre-existing disparities among Latino children, um, including higher uninsured rates and lower access to mental health services and supports. So I'm, I look forward to working with you as to specific policies uh, necessary to help advance mental health equity uh, and begin to close some of the racial disparities that preceded and have been exacerbated by COVID-19. And uh, can I get your commitment to work with us in that? Senator, I would be happy to work with you on this issue. And then finally, you, you talked about representation. You know, the Minority Fellowship Program, I think, is a critical component of this legislation. Uh, what else can we do to support the development of minority mental health providers uh, in the pipeline? Well, Senator, I think we can work with training institutions to be more uh, proactive and aggressive in their recruitment of candidates from minority communities. I also think we have to invest upstream, even before we're talking about admission uh, to a medical school or a nursing school. Um, how are we getting young people in minority communities interested in the healthcare professions at an early age when they're in grade school, uh, when they're in college? Uh, these are places where I think we have to focus, plant that seed early, and then make sure opportunity uh, is available uh, when they get to the stage of entering a training program. Well, thank you. Look forward to working with you in all these different aspects. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Look forward to working with my colleagues. Senator Brown, I think, is next on the web. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Murphy, good to see you again and in remote, and uh, thanks for your exemplary public service for so many years. Um, the advisory that you issued last year cites research about uh, the suicide rate among black children below age 13, how it's been increasing in recent years, black children almost nearly twice the, the far too high rate of suicide by white children also. Uh, I did a round table discussion in Columbus or in, in, with Ohioans not too long ago, several months ago. I, uh, Dr. Ariel Sheftel, principal, principal investigator at Children's Hospital in, in Columbus, 
shared her research on the increase in black youth suicide. Dr. Scheftel made the point, despite the fact that black youth suicide and suicidal behaviors have been increasing over the year, last decade, our understanding of the risks associated and uh, the understanding of the risks and protective factors um, associated with these behaviors in black youth is extremely limited. She argues we need more research on risk factors to implement more effective suicide prevention. How, how should research and policy come together to decrease the likelihood of youth suicide, especially in African-American kids? Well, Senator, it's good to see you again as well. And, and thank you for, for that question and for the particular attention to what's happening in uh, racial and ethnic minority communities. Uh, it's been very disturbing to see the increase uh, in mental health challenges, particularly suicide. Uh, in, in communities of color when it comes to young people. And yes, I do agree that there is more that we need to do to understand what factors are driving this, uh, whether it's violence in communities or tech, some element of technology or other uh, elements that, lived in, you know, that exist in the environment in which our kids are being raised. Um, but I also think uh, we can't wait uh, to act when it comes to making sure uh, that these communities have help. One of the things I, I think about often is uh, you know, as a doctor who cared for patients over the years and saw so many who uh, were not able to make appointments and couldn't get uh, their routine care, is we have to get care to kids where they are, uh, which means that if kids are in schools, as a majority of them are, we've got to get care to school environments. We've got to provide counselors, uh, mental health therapists, and others who can help identify and start to address problems. We've got to use technology more effectively to get uh, access to care to those children and their families. Um, so yes, I agree, we've got more questions that we need to answer about risk factors. Uh, I also think we know a lot that we can act on right now to improve access to care. Thank you, 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 you brought up schools and I, I wanted to ask, I, I plan to ask about full service community schools and mm -hmm. legislation I've worked on. My, my eyes were open, I know Senator Casey is interested in this too and I think he's gonna be one of the next questioners. My, uh, I was brought to my attention several years ago at Cincinnati and um, a community schools uh, building they have and a community school that they have done all kinds of interesting things in. But our bill would help connect schools with community partners to provide the integrated student support. I think you're suggesting physical health services and obviously mental health services, not just to students, and, but but to community members there. We've seen how integrating and education, healthcare can benefit students and communities, whether it's Medicaid support of school-based mental health and behavioral health services through full service community schools or in the form of school-based um, health centers. How, how should CMS work with the Department of Education to provide guidance and best practices for states on how to better integrate mental health services into our public schools using Medicaid supports, building on the full, uh, full service community schools model what what what's the path what's the path to do that right well senator th thanks for that question i love the model you're talking about because it's uh, the Im image that comes to my mind when you were speaking is that of wrapping our children uh, in supportive and protective services uh, including services and supports in the community and i think it's exactly what we need because schools can't do this alone uh, they can't do it by themselves. Educators are already uh, taxed uh, to a very high level. Uh, I know that this is certainly an area that CMS uh, has been interested when it comes specifically to Medicaid and how Medicaid can be used to better support mental health services in schools. Um, I think the challenge that we have, despite uh, some of the measures that CMS uh, has supported to use Medicaid funding to support services in schools, is that we still in some cases need states uh, to amend their Medicaid program uh, to free up the use of Medicaid funds uh, for those breadth of services in, uh, in schools and to apply those services to all kids, not just kids uh, in IEPs. Uh, the other uh, piece of this is that many states may need technical assistance in figuring out uh, how to set up uh, the types of school-based uh, you know, mental health care uh, initiatives that require thinking through billing, thinking through other logistics. Um, and I think those two have been barriers to states implementing this. But I know that CMS has certainly been supportive of the use of Medicaid funding uh, to support mental health services in schools. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I thank my colleague or any of, uh, of my colleagues still out there. Senator Bennett, have you um, spoken? 
No, sir. Senator Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and I am out here, that's for sure. You look, <laughs> I need a telescope to see the chairman. But uh, I, I can see you pretty well. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Murtha. That's why I came over here. But, I, Mr. Chairman I, and, and, and Ranking Member Crapo, I, I really appreciate your holding this hearing on youth mental health. It is, I think, incredibly timely because our children and their parents and our schools are looking for ways to support themselves and to avoid a worse crisis, actually, that might unfold. And it's really important for us to support them. And Dr. Murthy, it's wonderful to see you. And thank you for being here today and your focus on this issue. I enjoyed spending time with you last month discussing the advisory, and I'm grateful for your experience and your commitment to address youth mental and behavioral health. I'm very pleased that the Surgeon General comes to this as a parent, because I think that's a perspective that's needed right now, maybe more than anything else. I, I also want to take this opportunity to say that I think we need to do our best, you know, whatever we can to try to keep schools open for our kids' sake and for their mental health. I was a superintendent of the Denver Public Schools before I came here. I have a sense of the toll this has taken on our kids and the interrupted schooling that especially our kids living in poverty have, have confronted as a result of the pandemic. So I hope for their sake that we're able to come together, support them in their schools and keep them open. You might remember, Dr. Murthy, that I said to you when we talked before that if somebody asked me before the pandemic what the biggest difference was between when I was a superintendent and, and today when it comes to schools before the pandemic, my answer was mental health, mental health, mental health. And that is more true now because of of the pandemic. So with that preface, Dr. Murthy, I've got two questions I'd like to ask you. A few weeks ago, I spent time with some leaders from Summit County in Colorado to listen to local mental and behavioral health, to, 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 them, to, to listen to them discuss local mental and behavioral health needs and potential solutions. One striking theme was the pitiful reimbursement rates for mental and behavioral services plus wraparound services and casework from both public and private insurance. One organization called Building Hope, which provides scholarships to receive care, said that over 50% of their clients have private health insurance. The sheriff of the county was also on, and he mentioned that establishing a mobile crisis unit, which pairs a clinician and non uniform deputy to respond to crises, costs $1.5 million for the community, but saves uh, the county $17 million. There wasn't a person on this call that disputed this. I'm particularly grateful to Senator Cortez Masto, who's led on the issue of mobile crisis reimbursement on this committee. And what I, what I heard in Summit County demonstrates that reimbursement reform should be a cornerstone to our mental and behavioral health work here in, in the Finance Committee. So Dr. Murthy, could you speak to the importance of higher reimbursement in private insurance and also under Medicaid and Medicare? Well, thank you, Senator, uh, for that. And I always, when we chatted, I certainly appreciate your perspective as an educator yourself um, when it comes to our kids. Look, I, I think, as you know, we've got profound issues with mental health and care access. And I think reimbursement is one piece uh, of that puzzle. I think for too long, we've had low and inconsistent reimbursement for mental health care services. Uh, I think we've also not seen um, sort of the kind of implementation of the parity law uh, that, that we need. And so we still have private insurers that are providing less uh, reimbursement for mental health versus uh, for traditional medical services. So I do think this is an important part uh, of, of the pie. If we're going to train uh, more and more providers of mental health care, we've got to make sure that the systems and supports are there for them to be able to sustainably provide care. And a reimbursement is an important part of that. The, um, I've got one other question that's actually related. I, I wanted to speak to something specific about schools and Medicaid. In 2014, CMS reversed the free care policy, which now allows states more flexibility in school-based Medicaid programs. Now Medicaid can bill for health services delivered in schools to all Medicaid-enrolled children, not just those with a special education plan. Colorado is one of a handful of states that have received approval of their state plan amendment, which went into effect on October 2020. Now Colorado recognizes applied behavior analysis, speech language, patholo pathologist assistants, and school psychologists as Medicaid providers. And while these remain workforce challenges, 
Colorado schools are going to have the financing infrastructure necessary to support students where they spend most of their days. Dr. Murthy, do you think that CMS can work more proactively to help encourage Medicaid reimbursement uh, in schools? Can CMS provide guidance on how to expand those services? What can you do to work with leaders at HHS, the Department of Education, and the White House, and our, our school districts across the country to make some progress on this? matter. Well, Senator, uh, thanks for raising that. I would be certainly happy uh, to work with my colleagues at CMS, uh, you know, on this issue. I do think that the free care policy reversal to allow for all students, not just students uh, on IEP, is to be able to benefit uh, from Medicare funded uh, mental health care in schools is very important. Um, one of my worries is that there has not been enough uptake uh, in states, I think partly because of the state amendments that have to be uh, passed to do this, and partly I think technical assistance uh, is needed uh, in more states to set up the billing and other uh, procedures to make this a reality. But I think it's very powerful, and it, it's consistent with the principle we talked about early on, which is we have to bring care to where our kids are. We can't expect them to drive many, many miles with their families to see providers who, we've got to make it easier for them to get care. This is one way to do that. And I, I know my, uh, I'm, I don't want to impose on my colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Let me just associate myself though also with comments that were made about the effect of social media on our kids uh, in this country and there is literally nothing preventing the social media companies for the benefit of our society from sharing data about the effect of social media and the al algorithms that they have um, with families and with parents in this country and I hope they'll consider it. Thank you very much, Senator. And before we go to Senator Cortez Mastel, who will be next, um, I've been informed that um, Dr. Murthy has a hard stop at 1230. And the only way we are going to do that is if everybody sticks very strictly to your five minutes. <laughs> Senator Cortez Mastel. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Murthy, thank you so much for being here. I, I want to thank the committee for holding this. Uh, I want to associate my comments with or, or, or uh, my position with some of the comments made with my colleagues around the telehealth, how important it is with uh, Senator Bennett's comments uh, earlier. Uh, let me just say this. I think it is so important in this day and age that there is mental health parity with physical health. There's too much of a stigma around mental health. But nobody has a stigma about going uh, concerned about their physical health and getting the health care they need. Uh, and there's resources, there's uh, sources for funding, there's some professional care that's there, but we don't have that for mental health. And so, Dr. Murthy, I, I wanna talk to you about this because I see it in my state, Nevada. I we knew we were having mental health challenges even before the pandemic, particularly for our kids uh, and young adults. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated that. And we have to do more to provide essential services to them, the continuum of care of services, the funding sources to get those services and access, and then build up the professional capacity that's needed uh, to provide those services. But let me ask you this. I, I so appreciate you putting out your, uh, the Surgeon General's advisory. I, I think it is, uh, thank you so much. It's a great uh, educational piece for so many communities to really tackle. But here's my question for you is, how do you plan to get the word out? How do you plan on getting the advisory out in the hands of the people that need it so that we can start incorporating some of the recommendations that are in it? Uh, well, Senator, uh, it's good to see you again, and I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, one of the things that I uh, decided early on when I was Surgeon General uh, during my first tour of duty was that uh, we can't just produce reports that sit on a shelf. We've got to make sure that they are brought to life. And the people who bring them to life are community members. Uh, who uh, take the information, take the tools, and then create change in their communities, uh, legislators as well. We, there are several approaches we're taking. We've been working already uh, from, from the launch of our advisory uh, with community partners, with parent groups, uh, with uh, other community organizations, including faith uh, organizations, uh, and others to make sure, and educators are a key part of this as well, that people know about this advisory, they know about what uh, the recommendations are in this advisory, and that we can help support them, whether that's connecting them to resources in the federal government or whether it's connecting them to other community uh, resources. But that is what we are trying to do. I am also aware, uh, you know, and, uh, and I say this, uh, you know, just with humility, that, uh, that none of us can do this job alone. And I know that as much as our office is going to try to do, we need uh, the help of legislators uh, like you and others to help 
get the word out to help people recognize that, you know what, these recommendations can be acted upon. There are laws that can be passed to strengthen access to care. There are measures that uh, communities can take uh, to make sure that kids are supported who need it. There are things educators can do uh, to make sure that we're including a greater focus on uh, behavioral health and on emotional learning in schools. So uh, we're gonna keep working at this, Senator, because the job's not done when the report comes out. Um, we've got a long way to go. I, I can't agree more. And so let me add another area of coordination that is important. In your testimony, you urge coordination across all levels of government. Uh, and I strongly agree with that. Uh, I think there is a partnership at the federal level that needs to occur too often in their silos, particularly in this space. And that's why I sent a letter to both the secretaries of education and HHS. This is such an important issue. So can you talk a little bit about that? And I hope that that coordination that you've just talked about getting your advisory out there includes the coordination with our federal agencies. Absolutely, and this is so important. You know, Secretary Becerra from HHS, uh, you know, has asked for the uh, Behavioral Health Coordinating Council uh, to be formed, it, and has now formed, it is bringing together parts of the federal government to work on a unified approach to behavioral health. Uh, you know, I will say myself personally have worked with and been working with Secretary Cardona from the Department of Education. We have a shared passion and interest in mental health. Department of Ed, as you know, has put out resources for students and for schools to focus on social emotional well-being and on mental health. Uh, and that's a partnership that we're going to continue as well. But you're absolutely right. This has to be a collaborative effort. Uh, we can't afford uh, to be splintered and uncoordinated. And then very quickly, I, I've seen the benefit of, of the, and the value of peer support services. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, the importance of peer support services? These are really vital. Uh, you know, one of the programs that I, I came to to learn about years some years ago is the Beyond Differences program. It's uh, it's not a government program. It's a program that was started by uh, two parents uh, who lost their child, uh, and they were devastated at the struggles that she had with loneliness uh, and with her own mental health. And this is essentially a peer program, a peer support program, uh, where young people help other young people to build community and connection uh, and to build their self-esteem. Um, when we think about the healthcare workforce, I actually think we have to think broadly. Uh, this includes psychiatrists and psychologists and school counselors. Uh, but it also involves um, people who can be supports, uh, sources of support, educators, uh, peer, uh, you know, peer support uh, programs. Um, everyone has a role they can play uh, in helping to support the mental health and well-being of others. And this is where we also, I think, have to empower families uh, to also see that when they even begin conversations with their children on mental health and well-being, that's also a very important part of the puzzle. It tells kids that it's okay to talk about these subjects and to ask for help. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Senator Warren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're here today to discuss a recent advisory that the U.S. Surgeon General has issued on protecting the mental health of young people. And there are a lot of important recommendations in this report from how to treat mental health as an essential part of overall health. But I want to talk for just a few minutes about a recommendation for improving children's mental health that is powerfully necessary, but often goes uh, underappreciated, and that is access to quality child care. The child care system in America is broken. It's hard to find. It's massively expensive. It's totally out of reach for most families. And wages for child care workers are way too low. And then the pandemic hit forcing thousands of child care providers to close their doors, raising costs for the rest. Parents, women in particular, have borne the brunt of these policy failures. Dr. Murthy, helping families afford quality child care is important for a lot of reasons, like improving children's overall outcomes and letting parents go to work. But you say in your report that it goes beyond that. So, can you just explain why did your advisory recommendation include increasing access to affordable childcare as a way to improve children's mental health? Well, Senator, uh, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. And you're lifting up something that I absolutely agree needs more attention. Here's why we included that recommendation. And I know this as a parent myself, you know, that childcare is one of the greatest sources of stress for a parent yeah. when it's not adequately available. And when a parent is struggling with a high degree of stress and anxiety, that impacts children. 
Uh, we all know that, it's, uh, and we see that happening every day. That is one of the key reasons why affordable child care is essential. So when parents are struggling to find child care, the financial and the emotional stress directly harms children. But let's say a family somehow manages to find decent child care, they scrape together money to be able to pay for it, and while that fee is a lot for the family, it's barely enough for the child care provider to make ends meet. So the provider is struggling to provide enough staff and can't pay workers as much as they would make if they were working the checkout line at McDonald's. Dr. Murthy, your advisory also talked about the importance of investing in the child care workforce. What impact does it have on children when child care workers looking after them are understaffed and underpaid? Well, Senator, children do best when the people caring for them uh, are also doing well. When, and when you are not being paid a living wage, uh, when you are unable to do the basic things you need to support you and your family, that's extraordinarily stressful. Um, that is anxiety provoking, uh, that is difficult. And it is harder, I think, for caregivers to do the job they want to do, which is to provide good quality care to their children when they don't have like a, an income that can support them and their families. So we have to take care of the people who are taking care of us and our children. That's what this is about. Yep. You know, we rely on child care workers to take care of our babies, to help them grow while their mommies and daddies are at work. And yet child care workers on average are only making about $12 an hour. Uh, we need to invest in child care so that we can hire people, so we can retain them, um, pay make decent pay and benefits, let them build expertise over time and improve the care that they give to our children. And right now we have our toes on the line to get that done. A transformative investment in childcare and pre-kindergarten in Build Back Better, which would cut the cost of childcare for families and raise wages for providers. So Dr. Murthy, in our remaining time, just the last question I want to ask you, what kind of payoff will this investment in child care yield for children, for parents, and for child care providers? Senator, I don't know that I can count that high because it's a- <laughs> A great it's, answer. It's a big payoff. I'll just lastly say this. I cannot think of a more important responsibility than caring for our children. And it makes sense that we invest in that area, but when we take care of kids early in life, they become young adults and older adults who are also have a greater shot uh, at good mental health and physical health. If we've learned one lesson from this pandemic, it's that early investments in health and well-being are important, and child care is an important part of that. Good. These investments can't wait. We need to get this done. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you, Senator Warren. Thank you, Senator Daines. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Um, Cindy and I are parents of four children. Uh, we have three grandchildren, and supporting the mental health needs of our children is a major concern of mine, especially at this time in our nation's history. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly challenged our children in so many ways, oftentimes profound. It's upended how they attend school. It's, how they, it's changed how they interact with their friends. It's had a profound effect on mental health. From universal masking to stay-at-home orders, we're seeing how these draconian policies are affecting our children. After two years of virtual learning and forced physical distancing, many schools across the country still have not returned to normal and children are falling behind. More children and teenagers are struggling with mental health issues and suicide attempts are on the rise. There's a wise old proverb that says, a, a parent is only as happy as their unhappiest child. And it's so true. You can have four children, three are doing well, but the one that's struggling is right where the parents are emotionally and what consumes how we think about our kids. The New York Times published an article in the beginning of January, and I think the title said, No Way to Grow Up, it said, and it highlights how many pandemic policies have failed our children. I think that title really does sum it up, No Way to Grow Up. What I'm hearing is that lockdowns and closures have been questionable public health measures and at the end of the day have been harmful to our children. 
When I talk to people across Montana, I hear stories about the mental health struggles that come from lockdowns, from isolation. According to one study, lockdowns have reduced schooling, increased unemployment, reduced economic activity, and contributed to political unrest and domestic violence. Dr. Murphy, uh, do you agree that lockdowns and social isolation have helped contribute to some of the mental health challenges we're seeing today? Well, Senator, I appreciate that, that question from a fellow parent and a grandparent, as I understand it. Um, look, I, I've spent years uh, focused on the issue of isolation and loneliness. It has harmful effects on the mental and physical well-being uh, of our children. And this severe disruption that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, particularly with school closures, um, but with the uncertainty that kids had about their future with the 100 and now 60,000 plus children who have lost a caregiver, with kids seeing the friends uh, you know, and family members who had been impacted by this pandemic, that has taken a huge toll uh, on our children. What we have an obligation to do is to use the power of our science, our knowledge, our experience, uh, to tackle this pandemic with a scalpel instead of a blunt ax, uh, to put in place measures that can help protect people by recognizing that the cost uh, of major disruptions uh, to our kids' lives is significant. Uh, and that's why we have to use layers of precaution that can allow them to stay in school. It's why I'm glad that 95% of schools are now open for in-person learning, that 95% plus were open in the fall of 20, uh, 2021. Those included my kids who were finally able to go back to school and I was grateful for it. Thank you for that thoughtful answer, Doctor. Um, last year, the Biden administration issued a rule to require universal masking for toddlers attending Head Start. This heavy-handed mandate targeted Montana's most disadvantaged children, which is why I urged HHS to actually rescind that. I'm also concerned how this kind of pandemic policy will impact child development. A study from Brown University found that face masks and other social distancing measures in school or daycare may be associated with delayed language development among children. Additionally, referrals of children to speech therapy have been on the rise since the pandemic began. Dr. Murphy, how do we undo the damage caused by pandemic policies to address the health challenges facing our children? Well, Senator, uh, look, I, I share uh, your concern about the well-being of our kids, and I think getting back as close as possible to a sense of normalcy is going to be important for our children. They need to be able to play uh, with their friends. They need to be able to see the people they love. They need to be able to be in school and, and learn in school. Uh, and part of, I think, how we do that uh, is, and is recognizing, number one, we've got more tools to do that than ever before. We now, thank goodness, have medications and vaccines and boosters that can reduce the likelihood that people will lose their life or end up in the hospital, and that includes our children. Um, we now have more tests uh, and other mitigation measures, ventilation, masks, et cetera, that we know uh, can be used in targeted ways uh, to reduce spread. Uh, as cases come down, uh, Senator, as our hospitals uh, begin to see their caseloads drop, uh, I think we will be in a place uh, where we can consider pulling back on some of the measures that exist now in terms of mitigation. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that we will get there, but we've already made a lot of progress compared to last year. Yeah. A year ago today, uh, less than half of our schools were open, uh, less than half of our kids were learning in person. Uh, now that number is at over 95%. We yeah. gotta get it as close to 100%. And, and that's progress, and I'm, I am concerned that as we look at this, the healthcare challenge we face with the pandemic, we've not been Look at the biggest and, picture. And, and I just say to my, 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 my friend, these are important issues. We still have Senator Casey. Okay, We've got right. to get uh, Dr. Uh, Murphy, Dr. Thank Murphy you. And, and we'll follow thank up you, with our colleague and thank my colleague for being willing to be part of the task forces as well. It's going to be very important. Um, Senator Casey's next. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And Dr. Murphy, we're grateful to be with you again and to uh, commend your exemplary public service at this difficult time for the nation. I just probably will get one question in because I know you have to go. I wanted to start with something that I proposed in early 2020, just a, 
weeks before the pandemic, I call it the five freedoms for America's children. The freedom to be healthy, the freedom to be economically secure, the freedom to learn, the freedom to be safe from harm, and the freedom from hunger. And then I um, put that into a, in a piece of legislation that we introduced uh, not too long ago. But I was thinking about those five freedoms for America's children when I was considering the advisory and the, children, the children's mental health doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's largely impacted by the, their family, the community, their societal circumstances. We know that poor socioeconomic uh, conditions can create unhealthy stress both for a child and their parents and can lead to adverse childhood experiences that are known to put uh, children at risk for harms uh, later in their childhood or much later in life. You said on page four of your testimony, quote, systemic economic and social barriers like safety, housing, food, and economic insecurity contribute to and create the conditions for poor mental health for young children. I wanted to ask you, just in terms of proposals going forward, uh, as we discuss a more, a broader, more holistic response to uh, youth mental health needs, what broader policies to improve the well-being of children and families should we consider? Well, Senator, uh, thank you for that uh, thoughtful question. and. Um... I like how you framed uh, these five freedoms for American children. It reflects, I think, a really powerful reality, which is that there are many factors that impact the mental health of our kids. Uh, and food insecurity is one of them, economic insecurity, homelessness. Uh, these are all important issues we have to address because I think for a child to, to be well, they need to have secure attachments, uh, good, strong relationships in their life. They need to have safety. Uh, they also need to know that the future uh, has a place for them. They need to know that they belong. They need to know that the future is bright. And many children look around them. They see the violence in their communities. They see the threat of climate change. They see the specter of racism uh, and discrimination. And they wonder whether that's really true, whether the future truly is brighter for them, whether there, is a place, whether there really is a place for them. Uh, I think it is our obligation uh, to address these issues, to create a healthier, more hospitable society and home for our children. Um, we know these broader existential threats, in addition to the more immediate economic threats uh, that families face, uh, are, are really influential when it comes to the mental health uh, you know, of, our, of our children. So I think this is so much bigger than making sure our children have access to care. They need that. This is more than ensuring we are investing in prevention programs in schools. It's about recognizing the broader environment in which our kids are growing up has a profound impact on their mental health, uh, their relationships, their economic security, their safety, uh, as well as our ability to address these broader challenges like racism, climate change, and violence. This is what will help our children have a foundation uh, for good mental health going forward. Well, doctor, thank you. And I'll submit a question for the record on Medicaid in particular, integrating physical and behavioral health for children, but I'll do that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator Casey, and thank you for your passion for kids especially. Doctor, um, you're right on the clock at the hour to let you go, and I'm going to do that with just one qu uh, additional question. And first, let me just say thank you again for being here with us. You have once again shown over the last two and a half hours, going on three hours, you always give public service a good name. And it just Thank really you. means so much to have you. I want to just ask one quick question. We'll get you out the door. So two and a half hours ago, I talked about my concern about the prospect of losing much of a generation of young people if there's just mental health business as usual. And you said something that my staff and I flagged on over the course of the morning. We just like to make sure we understand this. You said a couple of times, there's an 11 year gap between the onset of mental health challenges and treatment. And as I was just walking over, I said, holy Toledo, that is a huge number of people. Can you tell us a little bit 
more as we let you go, what you mean by that and what we ought to be doing about it. We'll have to talk more about it when you have more time. Absolutely, I would be happy to. And Senator, this is a, an incredibly painful data point. It takes years for our kids to get help. That's what this data point is about. When we have chest pain, we know we can go to an emergency room and get care, usually within minutes or hours. Uh, if we have a pneumonia, we know that we can quickly uh, get care, at least in much of the country. The thought of having to wait 11 years after you have the onset of symptoms to actually get the care you need would be unacceptable when it came to our physical health and well-being. Yet somehow, we find ourselves in a position where we have tolerated that uh, for our mental health, and in particular for our kids. Uh, this is why not only are kids struggling, but their parents. The toll on families uh, watching children suffer like that uh, is, I, 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 I don't even know how to describe it. As a parent, the worst feeling I can think of is seeing my child suffering and not being able to do something about it. And that's a situation that so many parents are in today. Kids who are, do not receive help early uh, become adults who often end up struggling with their mental health. Uh, like with all things, prevention and early action, early intervention is better uh, than waiting too long. And, and that is why I'm so glad that we are doing the work we're doing together today. I want us to close that gap. I want us to get kids the care they need. America is better than this. We're going to work with you to make sure that we deliver on this key question. Waiting 11 years cannot possibly continue. Thank you. Thank you uh, again for being with us. The committee is adjourned. Thank you, Senator.